Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever time zone you're joining us from. Um, it is my great pleasure to welcome you to the ARC DR3 Forum Volume 2, Learning from Tohoku. My name is Liz Molly from Tohoku University, and I'll be today's MC. ARC DR3 is a joint initiative of XLab at UCLA, the Midai Kan, or National Museum of Science and Innovation in Tokyo, and the International <coughs> Research Institute Master Science at Tohoku University here in Sendai, Japan. Almost 10 years ago, on March 11, 2011, the Great East Japan earthquake and tsunami devastated this region of Northeast Japan called Tohoku. In 2015, the Sendai framework began, began the International Guideline for Disaster Risk Reduction, or DRR. Inspired by the Sendai framework, ARC DR3 seeks to explore design possibilities for risk reduction and resilience in architectural education, drawing from an international network of universities, professional and education partners, including the members of the Association of Pacific Rim Universities, or APRU. <clears throat> As we approach the 10 year anniversary of the Great East Japan earthquake on March 11th, the intention of this forum volume two is to share the experiences and lessons from 10 years of recovery in the Tohoku region and have an active dialogue with our international partners in ARC DR3. On the ARC DR3 website, you can find more information and detailed information about the initiative, about the people who are involved in it, and studios, and also about today's event with details. And I would like to show a slide, if possible now, of the overview of today's event. Um, so we have three thematic panel discussions we'll be enjoying today. And then during those panels, our team will be gathering the questions from the ArcDR3 partners joining us through the Zoom call and in the, through the chat, and also from other guests who are gonna be watching on YouTube. So we're looking forward to your active participation and discussion um, in the forum today. Today's forum also coincides with the Sendai Mirai Forum, which is another DRR initiative of Sendai City. And although EDDES director, Dr. Fumihiko Imamura, really wanted to be with us live today, right now he's at the Sendai Mirai Forum, where he will also be sharing the outcome of our forum at ArcDR3 today with them as part of a statement. So therefore, he has prepared for us a following welcome message. Hello, I am the Fumihiko Imamura, director of the EDITES International Research Institute of Disaster Sciences, Tohoku University. I would like to make welcoming and opening remarks for all of you to participate in the second event, ARC DR3 Forum Volume 2, Learning from Tohoku Program under the three years global and interdisciplinary architect and research initiative. We have the opportunity of the creating more effect integration with the theory, research, and practice design to produce and exchange knowledge that reduce the risk of the occurrence disaster. Since the Great East Japan earthquake and tsunami taking place on the March 11, 2011, and causing severe damage to the coastal area of Tohoku region. The Association of the Pacific Rim University, APRU, multi-hazard program began to coordinate school program with the EDDES Tohoku University in 2013. Soon after, in the 2015, the Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction was adopted at the United Nations Conference to guide risk management. In 2019, architecture and urban design for disaster risk reduction and resilience, ArcDL3 initiative was launched to bring planning, design, and research strategy into the conversation. Jointly coordinated by UCLA and Tohoku University, as a part of the APRU multi-hazard program in coordination with the 11 APRU member university. 
On this opportunity, ARC DRC Forum Volume 2 Learning from Tohoku event will showcase faculty members at Tohoku University who experiences firsthand the deconstruction and recovery process to share their knowledge and lesson learned after the disaster event. On March 11, 2021, this year, 10 years will pass since 2011 Great East Japan Asuka Tsunami. In the light of this, the event will be held to commemorate the memory and legacy of Tohoku region as well as the service as the stage to share and discuss the lesson guiding members of the ARC DR3 initiative. To reach their local object and while the addressing the concept of the evolutionary degenerative urbanism. With the exchange of the information, we aim to elaborate a platform for future education of the architecture and the urban design, suggesting that from each of the three sessions towards the future improvement and the strength of the goal of the Sendai Frame work for 2030. The 11 project will be further discuss in the conference, showing the exhibition and compiled into the unique publication by the end of the ARC DR3 initiative in 2022. The outcome of this event will rely heavily on the thoughtful engagement and the participation of the, not only the member of the ARC DR3 initiative, but also the student professionals and stakeholders. Therefore, we would like to ask all of you to find common interest in the outcome of this event through the presentation and the discussion in this opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Imamura. Next, it is my great pleasure to introduce Mr. Shinobu Matanishi, an executive director of the Mirai Fan, one of our important ARC DR3 partner organizations. Please go ahead. Hi. So, uh, thank you, Andrew. So, it's me. So, uh, good morning, uh, everybody. My uh, is from Tokyo. Uh, Tokyo is getting warmer and warmer uh, throughout the spring. I'm Shinobu uh, Nakanishi, I'm the executive director of the Miraikan and National Museum of the, uh, Emerging Science and Innovation. I'm very honored to be here. Uh, and I'm very, very excited to have the wonderful opportunity to discuss some very, very important things with you at the right aspect. Uh, before uh, starting the symposium, I would like to share a brief uh, of our new exhibition of Miraika. Uh, frankly, uh, I really want to, to count Noah Museum directory and uh, so uh, getting its grant directory in our uh, exhibition. Uh, but I'm very pleased uh, we still cannot to be together thanks to the COVID 19 pandemic. Uh, we have to be uh, patient a little bit more. Okay, uh, well, please start in the first video uh, with a song, please. ただいまから
なくなった人の数です累計の人数は時間とともに増え続けるため映像の途中で円の縮尺を変えて地図に収めていきます Okay, thank you very much.、Uh, and that video is、uh, no, no more global display called GeoCosmos.、Uh, uh, it was showing the COVID 19 pandemic's daily cases.、Uh, it helped you understand the current situation and how the、uh, coronavirus has spread around the world.、Uh, we updated the、uh, video data every, every day using COVID 19 data at John Hopkins University in USA. Uh, we hope that、uh, COVID 19 will、uh, come back as soon as possible and we would like to talk to face to face. Okay, uh, uh, so today、uh, I would like to、uh, talk about the exhibition of disaster and the future.、Uh, we just started the exhibition today, so it、uh, has been a wonderful opportunity to meet together here if、uh, we could hold a symposium in Japan today. Instead of it,、uh, I need you、uh, briefly the visual content.、Uh, please try,、uh, next, play, next please.、Uh, it has been the 10 years since the Great East Japan earthquakes.、Uh, many lives were lost and huge scares still demand in the regional community. I mean, we are applying.、Uh, Paying attention to the potential for、uh, earthquake striking directly Tokyo. Uh, plus, the、uh, COVID 19 pandemic is making it a more a complicated situation、uh, to make major against the、uh, disaster. I believe uh, our tier three project has a、uh, uh, sense control、uh, against those situations for the earth.、Uh, next slide, please. As the museum to think about the future. So, m i r a k e n has decided to hold uh, the, this uh, exhibition with NHK, a national TV station. NHK has huge archives about news. We、uh, levied the disaster again using the ton of、uh, videos and material that NHK archived in the、uh, face of the disaster. This edition makes you again recall the memory of that,、uh, that day and what happened, never said, 10 years ago. The edition is composed of the three themes, as you see、uh, memory, uh, memory of the earthquake, and、uh, as the bound、uh, formed by people afterwards. The zone tell you the disaster made us the strong bond、uh, between people. And not only in Japan, but between the whole of the world. And the last thing that the issue for the future、uh, this zone is t e l l i n g what we have learned by the experience of the disaster, introduced some great、uh, idea and、uh, practice. And this zone might be able to give us some hunch and idea、uh, for our DL3 project.、Uh, please, next, next slide, please. Yes,、uh, let's introduce some edition highlights.、Uh, main edition must be the video archived of NHK news and documentary press.、Uh, this media will、uh, show you what happened in Japan from、uh, 11th March、uh, for 72 hours. Let me do that a little bit、uh, video. Please start on the second video, please. Uh, this video is、uh, without sound, it's okay. Yeah, okay. So,、uh, the video s h o w NHK news to、uh, report the earthquake around、uh, East Japan. At the moment of the earthquake, the moment of striking tsunami for、uh, Tohoku area. 
and uh, we have to recall that what happened in uh, Tokyo after the earthquake. Okay, uh, please stop the video and back to the slide, please. Okay, the... so uh, this is the last form of the uh, restoration project. Uh, many, uh, many towns uh, village were lost in the earthquake. Uh, this project in the cooperation with architecture students across Japan and, uh, an initiative to restore uh, this town uh, to their uh, pre-disaster state uh, using model as uh, so one uh, uh, 500 scales. This model was uh, created in uh, 2013 as a, a town of memories uh, for Aminami Sun Lake Town, Miyagi Prefecture. And also uh, there, the execution of uh, uh, Fushima uh, recalls and impact of the uh, accident and the uh, flight. Okay, next, uh, please. Uh, here is a third zone, the issue for the future. Uh, we make use of the lesson in the, the earthquake to think about our uh, future and prepare uh, for the natural disaster. Uh, this exhibition is uh, a disaster uh, prevention, a crossword called uh, What Should You Do? Uh, it is kind of the cross, uh, crossroad game. Uh, this is think about your choice uh, when you face a disaster. Mm -hmm. Experience of the range of the choice as a disaster unfold in the virtual reality space. Uh, think about what you can do to do it to prevent the disaster. Okay, uh, next please. Well, uh, this uh, slide is so uh, 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 the primary uh, issue that the venue of edition at the uh, three in November uh, this year. So I show you the uh, photo of the pre event uh, of the Tokyo Vietnam in 19, uh, 2019. Uh, I am also producer of the Vietnam as well. The, the venue is uh, for Muromachi Terrace in Nihonbashi, uh, Tokyo. After the 3 we hold the exhibition the same hall in November. The place next to it. Yes, uh, this is a main hall. Uh, this is uh, an art uh, installation of the automatic printing machine of a banknote uh, by artist Mimit uh, Yansu. Uh, he created a big installation because there is uh, a headquarter of the Bank of Japan uh, behind it, uh, this hall. Uh, this, uh, you, you can look at the center uh, screen. So uh, uh, this uh, statue in the screen in the, uh, uh, Mr. H. Shibusawa. Uh, he was the founder of Bank of Japan as the first national bank is uh, 1873 in Meiji era. Uh, in uh, 2019, the Bank of Japan has announced uh, to the published new banknote uh, 10,000 Japanese yen printed Eiji Shibusawa uh, in uh, 2024. Then artist uh, Yansu took it into the, his mind to create the automatic printing machine that was a huge imitation banknote uh, close to the Bank of, uh, Bank of Japan. Uh, fortunately, he is not arrested by the police and, uh, on uh, suspicion on the imitation banknotes so far. <laughs> uh, please, uh, uh, ne next please. Uh, this is uh, the photo uh, we have the symposium by the uh, artwork in the uh, uh, same form. And next please. Uh, uh, it's, it was a great atmosphere and the situation uh, created uh, the artwork uh, to do a uh, creative discussion. Uh, we really enjoyed uh, the discussion by the automatic printing machine of the imitation banknote. Uh, the printing owner is uh, Mitsui Fudo san, and they all, already uh, have decided to support us uh, for the acquisition and the partnership for. Uh, 18th anniversary project. 
uh, then uh, we provided this for and the conference rules uh, for the uh, the uh, three exhibition in the, uh, this autumn in November. I appreciate it, Mr. Kudosan. Thank you very much for the uh, great exhibition. It will be also producer for the exhibition project. So I am very excited and collaborated with you uh, to create the exhibition. Next, please. Okay, uh, I wish you to see you directly in autumn in Tokyo. Uh, it, it could be a great opportunity to share your idea. So be generative about it through the exhibition. Uh, next, please. Okay, thank you very much for uh, your attention and ready to uh, look forward uh, to discussing with you today. I'll see you later and see you in Tokyo in uh, autumn, uh, November. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Mr. Nakanishi. I know that I'm excited to see your exhibit and I know we're all excited to the time when we can finally meet together in person um, in Tokyo. So thank you, thank you again. Um, next, I would like to move to our first of our three panels. And our first panel is on the theme of housing and community recovery. And the format of the panel is first we will have a presentation by our main presenter about some experience from Tohoku. And then later on, the presenter will be joined by the other panelists on the stage. And I will be the moderator also for um, this panel one. So as our main presenter for panel one, I'm very, very happy to introduce Dr. Haruka Tsukuda who is an associate professor in architecture here at Tohoku University. And Dr. Skuda has a lot of experience working in a number of disaster affected communities and with disaster affected people, and especially in developing housing strategies for an aging society, which is a key issue that we're facing now. So Dr. Skuda, please go ahead. The floor is yours. Thank you, Liz. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Uh, sorry, I try to use clicker again. Oh, okay. Uh, can, you, can you see my presentation? Okay. Yep. Thank you. Uh, good morning and good evening, everyone. I'm Haruka Tsukuda from Tohoku University. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. My presentation is about housing and community recovery for 10 years after the Great East Japan earthquake of 2011. Next, please. GEJ and the resulting tsunami caused huge damage centered on the Tohoku region in the north of Japan. Housing damage was especially great. In total, 400,000 homes are damaged. Next, please. Ah, uh, yeah, okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, damage was especially severe in Iwate, Miyagi, and Fukushima prefectures. Furthermore, Fukushima prefecture was affected by the accident and the meltdown of the nuclear power plant. Therefore, the construction of a large number of houses are needed. However, Tohok had two characteristics that made it difficult to carry out a general reconstruction project. First is population decline and aging. This is a graph of population increase rate and elder rate. In Tohok area, the population has been decreasing and the rate of the elderly has been high even before the earthquake, in comparison with other areas of Japan. Especially local area, this tendency is remarkable. Second is traditional style and locality. In the affected area, coastal areas, traditional fishermen's homes and their multi generational household lives remain. In other words, areas with different characteristics exist, exist due to widespread damage. The difference was particularly not noticeable between urban and rural areas. In the urban area, anonymity is high. Most families and nuclear families, mass housing has been surprised and the community connections were weak even before the earthquake. 
Otherwise, in the rural area, an anonymity is low, multi-generational families and the traditional houses remain, and the unique community is inherited. I summarize the issues of reconstruction work after JJE. The premise is that reconstruction work in Japan is mainly carried out by public projects led by the government. Then, at this time, the tsunami caused huge damage. Hazard areas for future tsunami were designated and new housing construction was prohibited there. And since the coastal areas of each city were also severely damaged, it is important to build housing linked to urban development. Besides, the important thing is that in Japan, public money cannot be used to build private pro uh, property. Therefore, the construction of disaster public housing, which is a direct inclined provision of housing recovery support, is important. Sorry, my microphone is uh, uh, trouble. Yeah, uh, go ahead. Uh, these are issues of construction of disaster public housing after GEJE. Our time is limited. I would like to explain context and space. First, I would like to consider the regeneration of the community. For the construction of disaster public housing, one way ask the following. How to deal with con communities to live their lives in housing? What needs to be addressed is different in urban areas and rural areas. In urban areas, it is important how to create a new community of strangers. In rural areas, continuity with existing communities is, is important. However, the existing communities themselves may also be affected. Then, where should we start to recover in rural areas? In rural areas, two examples to help us think about the reality of the community. One is relying on systems of traditional settlement. Other is relying on weak ties constructed under the modern system. Weak ties is the concept of human network advocated by Mark Granbetter, U.S. sociologist. Example of construction relying on systems of traditional settlement is Shichigahama town. Shichigahama is the smallest government damaged by the tsunami. In particular, we will look at the Yogasakihama district. Most of the shore area was damaged by tsunami because this town is a peninsula surrounded by the ocean. Uh, but the earthquake damaged not only houses, but also the community center, school, and public facilities as community hub. This is a traditional house of the fishing family in Yogasakihama. This remained. The house was in Gawa, like buffer to outside, and the shiki sometimes used as a public space inside the house. And in this area, a kind of seaweed, nori, has been cultivated working together as a community before the earthquake. So they created their local community association based on cultivation industry and has been maintaining for a long time. The local government decided to build disaster public housing in each community so that the residents can live again in the community where they had been living before the earthquake. And the they can recover their lives quickly. This is a reconstruction area in Yogasakihama. On the cut here, disaster public housing, relocation area, and the community center were built together. From before earthquake, 
in Yogosaki Hama, the community was active, especially a senior salon for preventing isolation of the elderly had been held from 15 years ago with the community association. So in the new community center, several events for community are held after reconstruction too. Next example of reconstruction relying on weak ties constructed under modern system is Kitakami in Ishinomaki city. The Kitakami district was an independent town before it was merged into Ishinomaki. There were 13 beaches in the affected area, which were combined to create the disaster public housing. This is the area for disaster public housing. The local architect designed based on interviews with survivors, especially disaster public housing in the south area is called the elderly. There is a path for residents and home gardens, and two detached houses share a single porch in front of their entrance. The six elderly women who live here originally lived in different settlements, but became closer during their time in temporary accommodation and decided to live here together. They chat together in one porch every day and they grow vegetables and flowers in their own home gardens. The, the interviews of us in 2020 revealed that although the women had lived in different villages before the disaster, they had established weak tied to acquaintanceship, such as having children in the same school district established under modern system. This became a strong connection when they moved into temporary accommodation, leading to the creation of a new community by these women after strong links in the traditional community were broken. And they can support each other in this new community. In these rural areas, houses were built to encourage traditional lifestyles and the neighborliness. Here, the touch rather than communal housing has been adapted to suit the local landscape and lifestyle. This is one designed by Atrivalva. The deck where the fishing equipment is brought in is located outside the kitchen. The decks of the two houses are arranged side by side so that they can interact with their neighbors while working. This is one in a small village designed by ADH. The compact houses are located around the main residential axis of the village. The last is a small cluster too, designed by CAP. Rather than placing the houses in parallel, the two units are arranged at different angles to allow for a natural intersection of sight lines. Finally, I'd like to turn our attention on prevention of isolation. Solitary deaths attracted attention after the Great Hanshin Awaji earthquake in Kobe in 1995. This occurred not only just after the earthquake, but also continued to happen for a long time. This especially occurred in disaster public housing after the Hanshin earthquake. Many units were built on coastal landfill, landfill near urban areas that were vacant. Since the elderly and the disabled were given priority, they quickly entered the completed housing. The residents in the disaster public housing were separated from their previous area and communities. Furthermore, those housing were high rise and large scale and the apartment style during the units closed off. So they isolated the survivors from public space. So after GEJE, we advised some governments to choose not the typical closed unit plan, but the front access plan as a more community friendly plan. In that plan, the living room faces the common area in South Side. Because in this type of unit, uh, residents can communicate neighbors daily from inside. Neighbors are aware of their existence. And because the plan is similar to the traditional house in, the, in a fishing village, we think that victims can continue their life choose to how it was before earthquake. 
Furthermore, we try to plan a new housing that would realize not only caring easy by community, but also awareness naturally. I would like to show some examples. This how much housing, housing was constructed in urban area in Kamaishi. The architect Manabu Chiba had to have 44 units built on a square site, so a saturation type design was adapted. The living room is located on a diagonal, so that is faces both the corridor and the courtyard. This is the other one in Kamaishi near Umachi housing. This is so that the corridors on the upper and the lower floors are in, direct, in different position from each other. Correspondingly, the living room is easier, longer and narrow with opening of the both sides, sides or facing only a uh, house. The last one is in Ishinomaki. Most of the residents moved from coastal areas. It was designed by uh, Mr. Hitoshi Abe. Low-rise houses up to three stories high with two buildings in parallel across the courtyard. The living room and the entrance of the north wing space the courtyard, while the south wing has access to the courtyard through a kitchen door. This is a result of questionnaires that we did in 2015 and 2017s. Although many respondents said that they meet each other in the common space, the number of people who call out to each other from their homes can be seen to be characteristic of this housing type. It is though that it, it plays a certain role in preventing isolation. I'd like to summarize this presentation. In Japan, the traditional settlement has been the unit for natural co co uh, mu mutual cooperation. If some of them, this has worked well in this time. In areas where the functions of such settlement has been weakened, weakened. weak ties created by the modern system have been found to play a role. The importance of the role of space can be seen in prevention of victims' isolation, the creation of new communities in urban areas, as well as in the communities that have emerged from weak ties. This is the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Tsukuda. I think we need more time to hear more of your stories about all of your experience, um, but thank you. That was really wonderful. Uh, we have one question right away for you uh, from Dr. Uh, das from the University of Hawaii at Manoa. And the question is, who is in charge of public housing, the disaster public housing in the local institution or what local groups or community groups are involved and is there any difference between the urban area and rural area for the disaster public disaster recovery public housing uh, yeah uh, the uh, all victims captured by themselves uh, uh, the uh, how, uh, disaster public housing uh, in the uh, same uh, municipalities so, uh, but uh, uh, some in some cities, uh, the uh, the uh, uh, people, uh, victims who lived in uh, local areas, choose uh, the urban areas. Uh, but uh, uh, some some people choose uh, uh, traditional areas. So the uh, the uh, uh, the. Uh, Mm, uh, the big uh, relocation uh, was occurred. So, uh, 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 for that reason, uh, some people uh, isolation uh, have isolation uh, uh, separated uh, the traditional community or a com a committee and lifestyles. It is a problem. Maybe can I ask one more uh, follow up question? If you could explain a little bit about the system in Japan for the disaster recovery housing of the national government role and local government role or community 
group role. I think it's very unique. Uh, yeah. Mm, yeah. The a big budget uh, from uh, from national government. The the national government to make uh, the uh, big frame, uh, but uh, uh, local government choose uh, uh, choose uh, some project uh, uh, for fitting uh, uh, their situation. Uh, so uh, uh, in that time, uh, national government. Uh, uh, ask the uh, committee, local committees, uh, as their, uh, their, uh, their, uh, as their strategy, their local government, uh, local committee strategy. Great, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, thank you so much again to Dr. Skuda. And uh, before I introduce the other panelists, I just I want to mention that Dr. Skuda is a double book today. So she has to give another presentation back to back. So she's going to have to leave us um, only in a few more minutes. But um, next, I would like to, in the interest of time, briefly introduce um, our four panelists and then before inviting each of them to share um, their comments and feedback. So, in, and again, to remind you that you can find more information about the members of ArcDR3 and our panelists in the people section of the ArcDR3 website. So first, I would like to introduce Professor Ronald Real, who holds the Eva Lee Memorial Chair in Architecture and a joint appointment in the Department of Architecture in the College of Environmental Design and the Department of Art Practice at UC Berkeley. And next is Associate Professor Daniel Abramson, in the Urban Design and Planning Department at the University of Washington, Seattle. And he's also adjunct faculty in the departments of architecture and landscape architecture, and a member of the Chinese, China Studies and Canadian Studies faculties. Next, Professor Wei Jun Wang is the Design Director of Wang Wei Jun Architecture and Andrew K. F. Lee Professor in Architecture Design and the Director of the Center for Chinese Architecture and Urbanism at the Faculty of Architecture at the University of Hong Kong. And finally, uh, Dr. George C. Yao is a Distinguished Professor, Department of Architecture, National Cheng Kung University, and Vice President for General Affairs and former Vice Dean at the College of Planning and Design and former Chair of the Department of Architecture at National Cheng Kung University. Thank you so much for all of our panelists joining us today. So maybe first I'd like to invite in the, in the same order, uh, Professor Ronald Real to share with us your comments. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you Haruka for that wonderful presentation. Uh, some of the thoughts that were crossing my mind when you were presenting is that one, I, I think it's very interesting to think about how disasters actually bring people together in remarkable ways. Um, we think about, of course, how disasters separate people, but there are, are kind of moments when people come together around disasters for the good of, of mankind and, and humankind. Um, and of course, those can be quickly broken and communities are fragile. And um, if, especially if there's not a, a space or a system or place for community building. And so it's interesting to think about the strategies for continuing to build community ties as a social practice and an architectural practice. And I really like those examples that you shared about um, the way that the architecture was transformed in order that in order for communities to be uh, connected to each other. And, and so some things that I'm wondering about is that is privacy also part of a healing process during a disaster? And I recognize that you spoke about how isolation is, is so traumatic and problematic, but I also wonder if there were spaces for privacy and, and healing in the same way there are for community building and privacy that is not connected to isolation, but privacy are as places where people can maybe, maybe escape those traumatic moments. And some other questions I have are really tied to thinking about this relationship between the rural and the urban and the differences there. And what are the characteristics and the cultural characteristics that are different between those two? And could there be community connections that are established across those two boundaries in some way? Um, and also, are there cultural characteristics characteristics that could be shared and could be learned from? So in other words, 
what is the relationship between housing and land in both of those communities, the urban and the rural, and could landscapes begin to form those kinds of uh, spaces of community as well. And I'm thinking specifically about agrarian communities and agrarian farming and what other systems might there be uh, for not only community building, but maybe literal community building. Can communities come together around landscape or around farming or around the building of actual, uh, the actual structures uh, in, in, a, in a rebuilding project? So I thought I'd share some of those thoughts. Thank you. I think in the thank you so much. Those are great, great points to pick up on. I think I'm sorry, but in the interest of time, I think we're going to have to leave leave some of those questions um, unanswered for now and come back to them as our as our further uh, further discussion and further um, activities of the network. Um, thank you so much. Um, next, I'd like to invite Dr. Daniel Abramson for your comments. Thank you, Liz, and also uh, thanks to Professor Tsukuda. Um, there were many things in her presentation that resonated with the uh, situation that we're working with in the state of Washington. Um, and in fact, uh, many of uh, uh, Professor Rail's uh, comments just now is something I'd like to pick up on and amplify or um, add to and take in a different direction. Perhaps uh, we are dealing with very rural communities on our coast um, facing tsunami hazards very similar to the uh, one that struck Japan in 2011, but much more rarely seen. Um, whereas in uh, Japan um, and many other uh, countries along the rim, rim of fire in the Pacific, uh, there is a, something of a, a culture, a seismic culture, uh, if you like, or a, an embeddedness of the history of relatively frequent events, nothing uh, rarely as big as the one in 2011, but uh, similar in quality uh, that have been embedded in the way people build in on the coast, the way that people live and engage with the sea and the shore. Um, and um, we're very interested to learn from that because we don't accept in our indigenous oral histories, uh, tribal histories that have recorded orally many, many generations of uh, earlier experience. There is very little in our settler colonial experience, which is only um, 150 years old or so in this part of our country of a non-indigenous people living in this environment. There is a great deal to learn um, and a great deal to absorb into our culture, um, but yet the hazards are very similar. Um, and uh, we have begun, our science has begun to uh, to map in very precise ways some of the effects that these events could have on our coast. Um, the question is, is how does a community um, which you know, to absorb and, and make use of this science, given that it is not part of its own history to have uh, encountered this before and, and plan this in mind. And a great deal of it depends on the ability of the community to act together. So this is where it comes together to the comments in the presentation we just heard, is that the community ties the ability to make decisions collectively, rely on social networks, that in rural communities um, are often in America, especially not, um, not reflected in the tightness of physical built uh, settlement form. Um, these communities are scattered, uh, they're very low density. Um, people live in ways that um, really highlight individualism and a kind of settler mentality of self and distance and space and privacy is not a problem. Um, the problem is, is how do people maintain connection? And they do that through schools and churches and organizations. It isn't as reflected in the physical form as uh, Professor Tsukuda was describing. Um, and yet uh, the community we're working with for our studio for this uh, series, um, our DR3, is um, has taken the initiative to build a, a the very first vertical evacuation structure for tsunamis in all of North America. And they did it at their local school. 
So we're really interested in how to build on that achievement to help the community um, uh, strengthen its social connection. Um, how can it do that through a variety of technologies? Um, some of them telecommunicative rather than uh, built in the strict architectural sense. But then how can we also build more of these structures in ways that enhance everyday life and uh, are embedded into community practice, um, not uh, just uh, precautionary in the rare event that this um, uh, will happen eventually. Um, so that's our challenge. Um, that's how I see us learning from what we've been seeing in this in uh, through this network. Um, thank, thank you. Very thank much. you so much, Dan. Um, and again, sorry, I think that uh, Haruka has to probably say goodbye to us now, but we definitely will keep um, this is just a part of an ongoing conversation, so we won't have, uh, we, we don't have the time to get into the nitty gritty, but we will um, in the future. And so thank you, Haruka. So I think you're, you're welcome to. I, I should uh, get going. Uh, <laughs> Good luck with your next presentation. Please uh, have some questions, please contact with me. Yes, and, yes thank you. Bye-bye. Um, so yes, thanks again to our first two panelists, and I think we're already picking up some strong um, shared overlapping themes with the relationships of community, it's spatial, the social ties, and the spatial forms. Um, so next, I would like to ask uh, for uh, Dr. Wei Jen Wang to share with us your comments. Okay. Uh, thank you. And, and first, I, I like to a few points. First, I like to share my reflection for not only the presentation earlier about housing community, but, but the whole events, which is um, it was ten years ago. There was that earthquake mm -hmm. and tsunami, and we all learned that. And I'm 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 impressed in a way and respect in a way that after ten years, and and I, I understand more or less the ability of, of uh, things more or less getting back to track. But, but somehow this thing's been continue uh, explored as a way that we learn from lessons. Um, I, I remember 10 years ago uh, after the tsunami, uh, my first impression is when I go to attend a few, there was a regular uh, architecture student thesis presentation uh, between Taiwan and Japan. and almost half of the students in Japan are addressing uh, tsunami issues. And that's my first impression. And I'm, so mm -hmm. I invited Professor uh, Onado to Hong Kong University and take a student studio to uh, uh, Sendai and, and, and looking at that. So I had the opportunity to participate in that. And, and of course I see already some projects being there. And I see, for example, some professor heavily involved in coordination of various re rehabilitation projects, and also in the museum of Sendai and many other places. And, and just by, this was, this was two years after or one years after the tsunami. And you go to a community uh, center and you look at the pamphlet or artist recording uh, what had happened. And immediately the, the emotion came mm -hmm. and you understand the situations. Now, um, and, and also, I also remember uh, various architects come to Hong Kong U for lecture, for example, uh, 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 Ito Sang, uh, and he he spent most of his uh, lecture not about his projects, but about the the very recent few months he was there organizing young architects engaging and community. It was very very different from what he was working on this this very uh, iconic kind of a opera house in Taichung, for example. He was he wasn't talking about that. So this is my general impression. And now 10 years after uh, Tohoku University and Tokyo University are working on this project, continuing working on this project. This is my first uh, reflection, I'm impressed. Uh, second is um, more about the, the issue here. I, I think what I like to uh, 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 address or ask is this whole notion of resilient. That's our uh, ARC DR3 uh, studio is about. So uh, I've seen uh, colleagues in California addressing, or United States Coast addressing file issue, for example, and this is so vivid and real. And, and or some 
May working on uh, earthquake issues and, and we're working on seawater rising or climate change. Uh, so climate change and file uh, are part of the, perhaps part of more related to climate change. Earthquake are somehow uh, more remote. I would say earthquake being a phenomenon all the way through. I'm not a scientist, but I say. Uh, so, uh, uh, and I'm, I'm trying to, and, and this project, uh, uh, Professor Tsukuda presenting all these excellent architecture projects are, to me, are good housing projects, okay? It's about making community, whether originally community or they've been relocated to another places. Uh, uh, the social bonding is more important. That, that's the theme, and they did wonderfully. But I'm trying to bring this together of our, the resilience that we cares about, which is, you know, what architecture should be looking at for the next hundred years. So in this whole immediate crisis of climate change and, and directly, and, and so let's say community along the waterfront, uh, islands, Pacific islands are going to be, you know, relocated or changed completely. So, or file, right? So how, how this different, uh, aspects of resilient be put it together, framed into a few clear target for us to work on. I, mean, I definitely know uh, energy uh, consumption is an issue, right? That and, and or the ability to uh, react to certain uh, situations that we have to uh, have a way to uh, escape. So that that could be another or in terms of certain uh, disasters that uh, crisis that less in less than hours, how do we able to allow community, so a whole bunch of elderly to be able to put together and say in the context of this new allium, then, then they are able to move up for five meters above, something like that. Because in Japan, I also see students proposing kind of uh, escape towers and when, if tsunami come in, I, I also learn, say, you have about 30 minutes or something to react. Right? So these are various issues there. And I wonder at the end, are we able to put together and frame something to address this issue? So that, that's one reflection. Uh, and the other reflection is about the whole issues of urban rural. Uh, Japan is facing a uh, uh, rural area aging community and also uh, agricultural land being uh, 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 under translation, uh, under use. And this is the same, exactly the same as where I grew up, Taiwan, and where, where not so much of Hong Kong where I worked on, but also in China, many rural village projects that I'm currently working on. So this, this beautiful picturesque sort of villages in the mountain uh, are, 90% vacant and housing deteriorating with a few uh, uh, elderly people there and similar to Japan. Uh, so how do we deal with this? Um, uh, cultural tourism is, but you can't make everyone, everything, every place is like bed and breakfast. So, so what do we do with it, with it? And if we look at the whole global uh, ecology things, we overly uh, kind of abused our resources. And therefore there are proposals of say in, in, in California of rehabilitate uh, ranches back to nature, right? And in uh, even in Japan, this was even more, I don't know, 15 years ago, uh, Ono-san was, Tokyo University was proposing this uh, uh, fiber city, which I'm impressed in, in the strategic level. So I, I just wondering if, if this, um, this whole issue if, if elderly community in Japan, back to the issues of Japan, uh, after tsunami and the, the village are still habitable and how we uh, help this, this uh, remaining 10, 50 uh, uh, elderly family to stay there and or uh, are we, which of those are we able to attract young people to come back and, and which of those uh, are going to be changed and in what way we can help to make the change slowly and decent in a way. Right? And, and also for the betterment of our overall urban rural 
uh, symbiotic relationship. This is kind of my uh, issue that I'm working on. And I also wonder, uh, uh, other than uh, all this excellent architecture project, award-winning architecture projects, right? But there's still that issue kind of outstanding there for us to uh, look at. I, I think I'll just stop here, but these are my kind of immediate reflection for the issues. Thank you. Thank you so much. That gives us so much to think about um, food for our ongoing discussion and especially to thank you for bringing back the thread of resilience, which is really the underlying um, concepts that we're, we're all um, grappling with. Um, so finally, for our last panelist, I'd like to introduce Dr. George Yao to give your reflections as well. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. All right, great. Thank you very much, Lee. Uh, Actually, the 2011 Japanese earthquake uh, brought a, a lot of shock waves to Taiwan too. I mean, shock wave not just physically the vibration; it was um, mindset of seismic safety and resiliency of rebuilding issues were were highly regarded in the Taiwan society. And the first reason for that is. Uh, we also have tsunami experience in recorded history. Actually, the last one was in, in 1867 in Keelong City, which is located in northern Taiwan. And it was recorded of uh, surge up to two or three meters in the Keelong Harbor. So that's a uh, live experience. So after we witnessed the tsunami damage caused to the Japanese societies, uh, the government is very worried about the future impact of tsunamis too. So the government launched a major program to evaluate the tsunami hazards in Taiwan areas. And one of the major reasons for such uh, research was that in the northern coast and southern coast of Taiwan, we have four nuclear power plants. And the government is very worried about it and spend a lot of money and time. And right now they are evaluating whether we should uh, discontinue some of the nuclear power plants based on uh, data that we analyzed. So the government did something on the tsunami issues. Uh, on the other hand, the society itself uh, kind of forgot the effect of tsunami may cause to Taiwan just a couple of years after the 2011 earthquakes. So people tend to forget uh, major issues as time flies by. However, uh, uh, this one major co common issues between Taiwan and Japan is Taiwan is entering an aged society too, which means we have more and more senior peoples in the societies. So one of the research projects that I'm, I'm involved with is to study the cell protection and evacuation of wheel bomb personnel and disasters. Uh, which is something that we just started working on. And we were hoping that uh, there can be some other researchers around the world to share their thoughts with us. And once we have some results, we're definitely happy to show them uh, to our colleagues. I, ha I have some slides to, to show you, but let me see if I can get it on the screen. Can you see it here on my screen? Oops. No, I guess not. Sorry, Dr. Yao. Maybe in the interest of time, um, we can keep your slides and you can share them in the with with us later uh, in the breakout room or or by email. Um, All right. if, that's, if that's okay for you. I'm sure people are, I'm sure that you're going to find some um, interested co-collaborators co um, for your project. All right, good, thank you. Did you have any more comments? No, that's it. Okay, 
Great. Thank you so much. And thank you for emphasizing the uh, similarities and uh, differences between the two, two countries. And um, yeah, I'm, I apologize in advance that we are going to run out of out of time before we can answer all of the great questions that have been uh, given to us to to from the zoom from the zoom chat so we will definitely be following up on that conversation um, but I wanted to bring kind of one topic that is seems has been a very active conversation um, to our panelists and the the first the issue was first raised uh, by Dr. Ulrich Kirchhoff, uh, assistant professor at the uh, University of Hong Kong. And the quest, the initial question is: Do disasters make us more conservative or and reactive? And how does this change the formal and spatial expressions of our culture? And so not at all narrowing down. We're going super super broad here. Um, and then the follow up question along the similar topic. Um, from Dr. Ken Oshima at the University of Washington is um, how does this play out in, in terms of conservative or reactiveness? How does this play out in the differences between government policy versus grassroots actions or and the role of designers within that? So um, yeah, that's a very broad question, but I would just like throw that out there for um, any of our panelists who might want to, to respond. Dan, go ahead. Well, um, we are we have a research project right now to look precisely at that question, um, and it's our hypothesis uh, with respect to the conservativeness of uh, preparedness and thinking and planning versus maybe the creativity of it um, has to do uh, with in response to disaster. Uh, uh, hazard information is that uh, it has to do with the framing um, and it may have to do with the nature of the community that you're talking about. Um, you know, we have already talked a bit about how some communities have strong social connections and a certain, regardless of what their physical built environment is, they have um, maybe deep roots to the place or they have strong um, social ties uh, uh, with each other, um, and that may that may be a, a definitely a factor. Um, but we think that regardless um, of the community's characteristics, the if if a disaster is framed as being part of a long history of environmental change that the community has weathered, that the community has in the past experienced in one way or another, or has or maybe has analogs in the way the community has affected the environment through its own actions and has changed the environment radically. If that can be presented as a geonarrative um, that in, incorporates future change, that uh, the fear and the reactiveness and the school-mindedness and defensiveness that is often associated with mitigation may be broken down and opened up and uh, uh, replaced with something a bit more creative, more robust, that uh, encourages uh, communities to pursue strategies that are useful for many different kinds of futures, um, and that might be also more meaningful to them in everyday life, rather than just hardening something that they find extremely precious and pay great expense to protect um, to, the, to the detriment of considering other things. So that was my response to that. Thank you, Dan. Um, do any other of our panelists like to um, add to that? Yeah, Dr. Wang. Okay. Uh, yes, I just quickly to, to the issues of, of um, more uh, is more conservative or, or more uh, progressive radical thinking. And I certainly, it's depending on how we look at uh, conservative or uh, 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 progressive, uh, mm -hmm. I certainly think um, this this disasters give us an opportunity to refocus the issues and rethink about what we mean by being progressive and radical. So, uh, uh, it, it, if it is if environmental crisis is just about adding more solar panels on the rooftop, 
or is it more than that? Is is about the way we reorganize housing? Say the, the one we're working on and and for the studio for tall housing, how we reframe the issues of tall buildings and to do it differently, and and how we able to change cross ventilation works and so on and change the whole housing typology. And I would consider this definitely more radical and and also social organization. Uh, uh, the way housing is organized in a way, right? So I would certainly consider this more radical rather than more conservative. Of course, it's reactive. It has to react and address the right issue. That's what I think is important. So this is an important question, but I, the, the other one is about the, the community, uh, the, the grassroots and the central government. Uh, 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 I My experience is, uh, at least from what I know, I understand for Taiwan, for China earthquake and 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 for Japan that I know, even for China that is a lot more central government uh, uh, motivated resource to address issues, uh, uh, highly controlled, but uh, still uh, just because of the the disasters of the changed earthquake, the people who live around has to react and talk to each other and. And, and facing issues that, addressing issues that they wasn't addressing uh, uh, for the routine daily life. So I think that the whole thing about grassroots, uh, if, although through different mechanisms, different systems, uh, political systems, they would be there anyway. And this is where we as an architects can take opportunity to mobilize that um, grassroots, for example. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm very sorry, but I think we are already a little bit over our time, so I apologize to um, our last two panelists, but I'm going to go ahead and thank you all again for your um, active participation in this panel and your great insights, and this is really part of a conversation that we're going to keep having and keep um, working together, so um, thank you very much, and I would like to close this panel. Thank you, Liz. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sendai Design League is a competition to correct graduation design projects of architecture students from all over Japan and select the best works in Japan. We architecture students in Sendai do all the management for the Sendai Design League. We are known as the Sendai Student Network of Architecture and Urbanism, SSNAU. This competition has a history of 19 years. Thanks to the support and cooperation of many people and the Sendai Media Take, it has grown into the largest exhibition of graduation design work by architecture students in Japan. It has attracted international attention, and in 2008, it was introduced as the hottest student event in the world by the British architecture design magazine, Blueprint. In 2009, students from Princeton University visited this competition. And in recent years, many students from Taiwan have also participated in related international exchange projects. Attracting attention both within Japan and in other countries, this competition has become an important opportunity for Japanese architecture students to become active in the world. Over its 19 years, the event not always go perfectly. As you know, the Great East Japan earthquake occurred in Sendai on March 11, 2011. At the time, the Sendai Design League held the exhibition at the Sendai Media Take.
The architecture models made by the students were severely damaged. In the decades since then, the Sendai Design League has been moving forward with the reconstruction of Sendai City and Sendai Media Take. In Sendai, we received encouragement from students and other people related to architecture from all over Japan. We felt warmed by the fact that our culture of architecture connected us. And in 2020, difficulties hit us again. Just before the Sunday Design League 2020, COVID-19 started spreading all over the world. We decided to cancel the competition once. We tried our best to think about how we could hold the competition while we were waiting. And we held the first free online competition, the SDLRE 2020. While online events have yet to be established in the world, it became a competition that demonstrated a new way of doing events. The competition also received a great response and it was an opportunity to establish itself as the greatest competition in Japan. As we overcome two major crises, we have developed a strong belief that we must never interrupt the history of the Sendai Design League. This year, the Sendai Design League 2021 will be held on March 7th. Hi, I'm Natsuki. I'm Sendai Design League Executive Chair in 2021. Uh, I think Sunday Design Week is one of the most important and exciting uh, events uh, in architecture world. Uh, but last year, we had no choice but to cancel the competition due to COVID-19. Uh, however, uh, we made a tree and plan an uh, alternative uh, project, SDRRE2020. Despite the regular decision and just before the event to not all uh, models uh, or people to into the Sendai Media Take, uh, we were able to archive success. Uh, thanks to the participants and those who <coughs> cooperated with us. Uh, thank you very much. Now, in Sendai Media Take, we set up architecture models for Sendai Design Week 2021. Uh, in short, uh, this year's competition is new world. Uh, COVID-19 has changed the city, the people, and even the buildings. Uh, in this world where uh, everyone is worried about the future, uh, I think how, we, uh, how can we open our own future? So uh, we would like to overcome this difficulty and make it a place for heated uh, discussion uh, as the first step toward creating a new world. Let's go.
good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening, but not quite good night yet for some of you. Um, uh, my name is Mohammed Sharif. It's a pleasure to be um, uh, introducing uh, the next panel, which is focused on uh, inf infrastructure recovery. Similar to the previous panel, uh, we will start with a 15-minute uh, lecture, and then uh, I will be um, introducing the panelists uh, who will be in conversation with uh, Professor, Professor Shunichi Koshimura, uh, uh, who is joining us uh, from Tohoku University, uh, the IRIDES, uh, the International Research Institute of Disaster uh, Science. Um, Professor Koshimura is an expert and innovator in the field of seismology and associated phenomena, especially tsunamis. His applied research focuses on real-time tsunami forecasting and developing projective anticipatory modeling of sociological impacts, in, including geoinformatics. So I'm going to hand over to uh, Professor Koshimura uh, and look forward to joining you um, in 15 minutes. Thank you. Uh, good morning uh, for Asia. Good morning, uh, good evening for the uh, United States and then good afternoon for Australia, I guess. Buenos noches for Chile. I'm wondering who is coming from Chile now. Okay, uh, so can can I slide uh, the share my slides, please? Okay, uh, let me start with the uh, talk about the lessons we have learned. Uh, again, I'm Shunichi Koshimura from Tohoku University. Uh, actually, I'm a civil engineer studying the tsunami science. And then this is the first time for me to join Arc D Earth 3. Uh, thanks for having me here. And then it's wonderful to gather all over the world. So today, taking this opportunity, I will talk about what we have learned from Tohoku event 10 years ago from structural aspect. As you see in my title slide, uh, Tohoku University is one of the uh, universities close to the affected areas. So many of us have tried our uh, best to make contributions to recovery efforts. Actually, I have many things to talk about what we have learned from Tohoku event. Uh, but the, uh, I, I, I'm, I wanted to spend more time and uh, spending for hours for that, but I'm not allowed to. So if you are interested, uh, please read this paper uh, published in Philosophical Transaction the Royal Society, uh, describing the pre and post disaster paradigms, so tsunami disaster mitigation in Japan. Now, uh, let me show some numbers, uh, 58, 260,000 and 100. These are the number of characterizing stats of tsunami disaster, uh, 58 tsunamis, and click 58 tsunamis caused 260,000 deaths in 100 years. So taking average, we count, we count more than 4,600 uh, deaths per occurrence. But this rate, is, I think this rate is very high compared to any other natural disasters, including storms, floods, and earthquakes. But this number is dominated by two catastrophic events. One is the 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami that killed 220,000 people. And the other is the 2011 Tohoku event that killed uh, about 20,000 people. So what, what we can learn from this stats. So destructive tsunami is very rare event, but uh, we have to note that the once it occurs, it will cause huge impact to our society. So let, let's see. Uh, sorry, I think this is a little noisy. Uh, so let me show some. Uh, this is a brief summary of the impact of the whole thing, which caused 150, 161 square kilometers inundation area, and then highest runoff was 40 meters above sea level. And then uh, 18, 000, more than 18,000 fatalities. Uh, that is about 3% of the population in the Indian nation. And over 120,000 buildings were destroyed and estimated 25 trillion yen as economic losses. That is up to a quarter of annual budget of Japan. So we call this man, national crisis. So 
the tsunami is a consequence of the great fault rupture in the Earth's crust, uh, which causes huge amount of water displacement. Then it propagated to coastal areas that penetrate inland up to 40 meters above sea level. So what you're, show, what you're looking at is the computer simulation uh, to understand how tsunami is genera was generated and propagated to coastal region. So looking at the, the measured tsunami height at the Tohoku, uh, red dots, these are the two thousand from the 2011 event. And uh, with some comparisons of the past events, blue dots. So what we can see, what we can see from this, so we can see a remarkable features of a 2011 event. It's not only about the peak value of the tsunami height that is up to four, 40 meters above sea level, and also, but also the wide range from the north to the south, the wide range of tsunami affected areas. Having this remarkable feature, uh, we determined that the 2011 event is a catastrophic disaster with a recurrence interval of 500 to 1000 years. So now uh, let me show the, the tsunami simulation at attacking Sendai Coast. Uh, this is uh, the animation from the com our computer simulation. So that tsunami reached an uh, hour later uh, from the earthquake and then penetrated about five kilometer inland. So, uh, so that's the, the way we have, we, we tried to understand what was happening at the time of the tsunami attack. So in the real, but in the real world, not in the computer, in the real world, uh, this seawater penetration devastated our beautiful coastal areas. So this is a comparison of pre and post tsunami satellite images in Alahama, Sendai City. So I guess that many of you visited this neighborhood, beautiful neighborhood. So the extensive field survey of structure damages like this, I think this, I'm showing this one example of the structure damage map and the measurement of tsunami flow depth led a new empirical finding, so the structural vulnerability. So this is so-called the tsunami fragility curve. Uh, so this is a plot of structural damage probability of houses as a function of tsunami flow depth. So you can see two plots. One is the from Tohoku uh, in Miyagi prefecture. That is the empirical relationship of the structural damage probability and uh, measured flow depth. And the other one, the other one is the plot from we had from the 2000, 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami from Banda Aceh, Indonesia. So what we can see from this, what we can see from this. So we have, for example, for the two meter flow depth caused about, uh, I think it's the, my, the screen is too small for me. Let me, Okay, two meter flow depth causes 20% of the structural destruction. Four meter flow depth, 60%. And the six meter flow depth, 80%, like that. So we can see the structural variability by using this kind of relationship to understand the variability of our houses. So as a lesson, we can, we can tell so over two meter tsunami flow depths potentially causes severe damage on houses uh, or may devastate. That's the one I, th I think we have learned from the observation. So talking about the Sendai City's reconstruction plan uh, with, the, with the lessons we have learned, Sendai City decided to incorporate the concept of uh, multi-protection, uh, uh, multi-protection measures to minimize the future losses. So that, that consists of the seawall on the coast, the first line, and uh, the second, uh, the, and the coastal forest, and then coastal elevated road as the second defense line. And then behind that, evacuation facilities and the residential areas. So this picture is showing the aerial view, uh, this one, uh, this is the, showing the aerial view of the elevated prefectural road uh, that was named the reconstruction road. I think it, this is a sort of the icon of uh, recovery efforts of the Sendai city. So the key is how this kind of measurement, uh, the tsunami uh, countermeasures would work or will work in the future. 
So that's, I think that's our job to confirm that how this concept will work for the future tsunami risks. So this is, the, this is my job in working with the Sendai City Office. We run so many simulations uh, with the various tsunami scenarios and road plans. So how high the road should be elevated and then uh, how that road should be configured. So we have some uh, many scenarios of the road, road design and the configurations. And then finally, we found that the elevating six meter uh, with a little eastward offset to present prefectural road will show a reasonable performance of the mountain protection. So taking a look at this, uh, we remember that the first one I showed you as a simulation of the Sendai City tsunami. So we found that uh, this configuration will reduce the tsunami inundation area to the half of we've had in 2011. So this is used as a basic information of future land use plan and number urban configuration. So one more about the structural aspect. So seawalls and breakwaters. So this is the world largest tsunami breakwater in Kamaishi, Iwate Prefecture. So before 2011 event, all of us believed is its functions to protect our society because it, this is a great seawall with the length of two kilometer and the surface height above sea level is eight meter with the width of 20 meters. So huge concrete structures uh, can make, uh, can provide the functions to protect our society, even from the huge tsunami with an assumption tsunami would never overtop. Oops, okay. So, but uh, in 2011 event, you can see that the, that tsunami overtop many times causing ex exceptionally huge lows and erosion at the base. So consequently, those effects made huge concrete structures overturn. So this is a consequence of tsunami attack. So the lesson, so it's very simple. Even great seawalls can fail. The last one is on the tsunami hazard map because we, we are concerned about how we can find a safe place. So hazard maps or evacuation maps taking a very important role of that. So on tsunami hazard maps, let me show you this one. So this is the one we had, we prepared before the 2000 event. I think this is a basic uh, map for the local tsunami inundation uh, uh, understanding and then understanding risks of the tsunami inundation and then to, to learn where is the safe place and then where to go. So like that. So red, yellow part of the area, that's the, that is concerned as the tsunami risk area before the 2011 event. So let me add the tsunami inundation zone in the 2011 event. So how does this look like? So some people says that, oh, it's, it's, it's consistent with the, what we have expected before 2011. And then some said it's more than, more than expected or more than what we have prepared. So what we, have, what we can learn from this. So the tsunami has a map. Knowing which areas are at risk, at risk is, is very critical, but one must also recognize the predictive limits of science and technology. The hazard maps cannot always accurately predict areas at risk. So governments can reduce the risk, but the communities must not feel completely safe. So even now, computer simulations uh, cannot predict everything that will happen in the disaster. Uh, the hazard map, in that sense, hazard maps have two functional aspects. One is to tell people that they are, they are at risk. On the other hand, uh, the hazard map could function to assure res residents living outside of the ex expected inundation zone that they are, is not, uh, they are, that area is not at risk. So I think this is the one negative aspect of relying too much on the hazard map. 
So the lessons, the hazard map have two functional aspects. So we have to know that. So as a summary, uh, because of limited amount of time, we, we, uh, I, I could not take many times to learn and to explain what we have learned. But uh, as a summary, uh, two points, knowing risks. No, knowing which areas of risk is critical, but that there are predictable limits of science and technology. And then also two functional aspects of hazard map. Uh, but the structure of already, over two meters tsunami flow depth potentially causes destruction of houses. And then coastal infrastructure can always protect life and property, even great seawalls can fail. So that's what we have learned. And then after that, I think it's in, uh, in the panel discussion, uh, how that lessens or consequences the experience led the present tsunami countermeasures in Japan. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, Koshimura. Uh, I would like to introduce uh, the panelists before we um, begin the discussion. Uh, today we're joined by uh, Professor Toshik Hazu Ishida uh, from the Department of Architecture and Building Science at Tohoku University. Dr. Ali Mosle, uh, Distinguished University Professor and Evelyn Knight Chair in Engineering at UCLA. Uh, Professor Mosle is also the, the Director of the B. John Garrett Institute for Risk Science at UCLA. Uh, also joining us is uh, Professor Toshio Otsuki uh, from the Graduate School of Engineering at the University of Tokyo. Professor David Ma from the School of Design at Melbourne University. And lastly, Professor Shinya Okuda uh, from the National University, of, the Department of Architecture at the National University of Singapore. So um, again, uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Professor Koshimura. Uh, and I would, um, what I'm going to do is I'll ask each of the, the, the panelists, um, as I see them on my screen, uh, as they appear to me from left uh, to right, to um, to uh, engage uh, with you through their thoughts and observations. If, if, uh, if it's okay, I would like to start with um, Prof Professor uh, Shinya Okuda. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for uh, ArcDRC uh, organizer, Tohoku University, and uh, Mohamed, uh, Prof. Uh, Koshimura. Thank you very much for uh, uh, a very uh, condensed and, uh, uh, the presentation. Uh, uh, I'd like to uh, briefly introduce myself. Uh, I, I'm a Japanese architect in Singapore, uh, the currently appointed associate professor in architecture uh, in the NUS. Uh, my area is uh, sustainable architecture construction. So I may not be very qualified to really uh, comment on uh, uh, Professor Koshimura's uh, uh, infrastructure project. But I can perhaps uh, very briefly comment uh, 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 some similarity and uh, difference uh, with the Singapore, uh, where I reside in 12, 12 years now. Um, I can see that the, um, uh, the scale of the, uh, your research uh, is very much uh, wider. Uh, you really perhaps the directly working with the nature, which is not the object of uh, uh, control. While that the, uh, Singapore is maybe the uh, size of the uh, small bay, the, it's the size of the Awaji Island actually. So uh, it's everything must be under control, include the built environment and the nature itself is under human's control. So that's perhaps a very uh, a different aspect. Uh, but I also find the similarity is that the, um, the uh, Professor Koshimura working on the uh, tsunami he mentioned that it's very rare, maybe like every uh, hundred years, but once it's happened, the impact is uh, huge, enormous. I, I'm working on the reforest city, which is also the uh, planning of always 50 to 100 years. So uh, the time span wise, perhaps there, there might be some uh, similarity. Uh, maybe what, what perhaps I can contribute within a few minutes is that maybe I can uh, very briefly point out uh, uh, my observation and the learning from the uh, Singapore uh, city planning, which consider one of the most uh, uh, integrated and strategic 
uh, perhaps that uh, I can uh, uh, share that how this can be happened. Uh, so Singapore was uh, started from 1960s only and uh, was very uh, slum and a poor infrastructure, lack of sanitation, uh, but became a, a sustainable livable cities in uh, five, six decades. Uh, I observe uh, three key points. Uh, first is uh, political leadership, and the second is uh, there is the existence of the concept plan, which is spanned 50 years, uh, visions. And the thirdly, uh, uh, interweave uh, quality of life, sustainable environment, and from my point of view, surprisingly, they interweave the competitive economies. Uh, so the first part is uh, political leadership is, uh, of course, it's uh, led by Lee Kuan Yew. And uh, I think the most impressive part for me is that the different government agencies cooperating and work together seamlessly on, almost. And the uh, second point is about the con existence of the concept plan since independence is uh, there is the vision for the 50 years uh, and if it's renewed uh, every 10 years to make some uh, 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 master plan for the executions. And my last point is that uh, um, Singapore has a livability framework concept, uh, which uh, includes three factors, quality of life, sustainable environment, and the competitive economies. Uh, yeah, uh, as a Japanese living in Singapore, that uh, I, I won't surprise to see uh, quality of life and sustainable environment is very important for the uh, livability. But uh, I see uh, perhaps the most unique part is to uh, interweave the competitive economies, uh, such as like autonomous vehicle or the AIs, as a part of sustainable living and the quality of life. That's what I see uh, uh, interesting part of the Singapore city plan. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Professor Okuda. Um, uh, Professor David Ma. Invite you next, and then I'll be inviting uh, after that uh, Professor Mosleh, then Otsuki, and then lastly Professor Ishida. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mohammed, and thank you very much, Professor Koshimura, for a very informing um, uh, presentation. Um, there's a couple of things. I, also, I think I'll have to preface um, my comments in the same way that Professor Okuda from the NUS um, did by qualifying that I'm not a structural engineer. Uh, so in many ways, my comments and my reaction uh, to your presentation will be largely tempered by the fact that I'm, in, um, I'm within the architectural and urban design fields. But I mean, certainly one of the things that was very was an interesting takeaway, at least from a very kind of from my lens, is the fact that it's clear that the kind of traditional uh, attitude of having a kind of a single line of defense, kind of steam walls, seems to be a strategy that's being questioned. And it seems to be that there needs to be multiple layers and multiple levels across which uh, infrastructure of different sorts are embedded uh, within um, a, a kind of, I guess, a deeper uh, area. So that also, for us as architects and urban designers, means that we have to pay very particular attention to how urban design, urban form might actually be uh, very much a, an aspect of enabling this form of uh, defense, I guess, and it becomes a kind of infrastructure. So that, that was a very good takeaway, at least for us, um, speaking as a, as a designer. Um, one of the things I also would also thought would be good uh, to do is to try and maybe um, link the discussion about infrastructures that has to deal with kind of major shocks, uh, which as you mentioned are very rare, um, but then they also need to kind of have a life over most of the other time where those shocks are not present. So somehow this idea of temporality with infrastructure and um, I'll kind of also, that's informed a lot by, unfortunately, not necessarily strictly my research uh, background, but perhaps a little bit of my uh, professional background. For a long time ago, I was working on uh, the Olympics master plan in London, which is also a very rare event. <laughs> it only comes to cities once in a while. But the interesting thing about working on that project was that um, there was a very clear understanding that um, you are designing and over-designing infrastructure for two weeks. So in many ways, a lot of the infrastructure had to actually take millions of people. And then very quickly, if we were to actually convert that into something that was for uh, embedded into the community, which was the ambition of the plan, you needed to descale the infrastructure, you know, re, re, uh, pretty drastically. Right? So, um, so that's something that I think might be interesting as a discussion about um, 
you know, infrastructures that are really designed for very rare occurrences, but they also need to be uh, the frameworks for a community that lives within them. And I, I, I know within the case of the Olympics and the ability to transform, it's a very different time scale to having to deal with a, um, with a, a tsunami, uh, which from I think from the last presentation, it seemed to be a half an hour <laughs> notice as what the Professor Adamson said. So and then I wonder if there might be something also about um, what you suggested that a more embedded um, an embedded, embedded form of infrastructure might be interesting. I think again, going back um, uh, to the last presentation, the last panels, this idea of um, these kind of escape towers that are embedded and distributed within the fabric as being one possible understanding. So I, it's kind of something I think it raises a few interesting points, at least for me, um, something that I've taken from my professional experience into the research arena is, is trying to look at the temporal um, and the kind of phasing and uh, kind of different phases in which infrastructure can actually operate in and understanding that infrastructure actually in many ways quite often when it's designed according to um, ideas of optimization, we do forget that there's a kind of temporal aspect and they have multiple states within which they need to be. So that's something that I think is interesting. And somehow it's taken away um, within your idea of the multi-layered embedded form of infrastructure. It's something that's that's kind of well well articulated to me anyway. So that's that thank you very much for that. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. We'll turn the mic over to Dr. Mosley. Uh, first, I'll unmute my <laughs> mic. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity in front of this great panel. Uh, uh, well, uh, I also must uh, have the, this disclaimer that it's become, uh, you know, the usual introduction. I'm not a structural uh, uh, engineer uh, by training. I'm actually a nuclear engineer by training <laughs> and uh, came to know structural uh, engineering. And in fact, there was a chapter in my thesis many centuries ago on fragility curves and how to estimate fragility curves uh, when you don't have historical data. So I was delighted to see uh, Professor uh, Kushimaru's uh, uh, fragility curve showing the uh, the relationship between the damage and the water elevation. Uh, uh, I am um, uh, by training a risk analyst and the extension, uh, more modern extensions of risk assessment uh, to resilience and uh, resilience uh, assurance and planning. And I come from a quantitative school of uh, risk assessment. Maybe we try to quantify and measure risk uh, of, uh, of various uh, uh, natural and, and man-made disasters. Uh, the, the, I have a, a very deep uh, connection with the, with the tsunami, uh, uh, Toka tsunami, and that is the impact that it had on uh, the infrastructure, electric power in infrastructure and uh, nuclear uh, power operations. And uh, the, there are lessons from uh, that, at least from that narrow perspective of, of a, one particular facility that is very similar fundamentally to uh, what uh, Professor Kushimura uh, presented uh, identifying basically the hazard map and then what happened and, and uh, what level of consequences uh, were, uh, we were prepared and, and designed and uh, things that were, were actually not adequate and uh, turned out to be uh, basically a, a point of uh, problem and cause of uh, significant damage. That is, in the nuclear industry, there is this concept of defense in depth. Namely, you do not rely on, irrespective of how much your calculations show that the risk is low, you do not rely on one level of defense. You come up with diverse defenses. So if you look at the nuclear power plant, you see that we have not only ways of protecting the core of the nuclear power plant by providing cooling and emergency cooling in terms of an accident, but also to prevent the core from melting, but also we develop uh, 
a containment on top of that, uh, the core, that if in case it melts, that you have a control, you limit uh, the release of radioactive material to the environment or uh, reduce or actually uh, prevent that from, from happening. And uh, so the, the, the notion of finding diverse defenses is uh, something that resonates with me. And I think that's something that uh, calls for creative ways of uh, uh, designing the structures and uh, the the architectural landscape of uh, of cities and future cities. Uh, how can we leverage uh, basically different ways of uh, 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 technology to to prevent and protect? Uh, you know, with multiple layers of uh, of protection. Uh, in the uh, uh, these things, of course, to start with uh, some type of assessment of uh, what types of risks you you are faced with, and in the context of basically, you know, uh, the general question of hazards that uh, we are facing in the you know natural environment, and then uh, in terms of the built environment, the, the source of hazard could be the built environment itself, as we all know that. Uh, a, when I look at the, the the vulnerabilities that we face, obviously we, everybody knows that the infrastructure we have is not just buildings, and we have a lot of other things that are. We have roads, we have a, we have the conventional uh, infrastructure, water supply system, power supply, roads, uh, phone lines, and fuel distribution, gas stations, and traditional. Then we have the more recent infrastructure, internet and wireless uh, communication. And we have the uh, emerging infrastructure, you know, connected, uh, connect, uh, connected mobility, roads that are smart and uh, uh, internet of, of, of things, broadening, you know, the, the types of things that form the fabric or foundation of what a society needs and uh, needs to protect and needs to, to safeguard. And uh, so uh, many natural hazards, as they happen, they, uh, they can attack multiple uh, uh, aspects of our infrastructure. And uh, so uh, they, they may be vulnerable to you know, say, so tsunami, earthquake at the same time. And that, that we always see in, in most natural disasters. Uh, Recognizing again how to prevent, you know, how to protect ourselves and infrastructure uh, is one thing, uh, and then then we need to to analyze exactly what the, those vulnerabilities are, and that's what we do. And in the, the domain of risk assessment resilience, we analyze these things through systematic way of identifying scenarios and what could initiate them, what would be the consequences, in a methodic way, mathematical simulation, probabilistic. And one core element in, in uh, assessing the, the risk to the infrastructure is recognizing their interdependency, uh, which is uh, basically a reflection of the complexity that we have in the infrastructure and also complexity of uh, protecting those, uh, again, the damage to the infrastructure from external hazards and also recovery. Uh, where we hit with a disaster and the recovery of electric power depends on, uh, on, on uh, water supply and vice versa. Uh, of, of, uh, we have the uh, communication that relies heavily on uh, electric power and all the recognized and sometimes very subtle interdependencies that, that we, we can see in, in the infrastructure. So the uh, a, Identification of, of those interdependencies as, uh, should be a, a critical part of uh, any assessment of the risks and, and pathway to more resilient uh, uh, com communities and cities. And uh, uh, a, the, I want to go back to the concept of uh, uh, multi layered defenses. Uh, of course, you know, saying that is much easier than actually trying to implement those that I know the, the complexity from a uh, engineering point of view for sure. Uh, but uh, uh, we need to recognize that uh, defenses can fail as we have seen in the past. 
we thought that Fukushima was well protected and other plants in, the, in Japan were well protected against tsunami. And we're off in our calculations. And, uh, and then right there, after that, we didn't even have any defense against uh, uh, the, the tsunami. So uh, uh, extending our imagination beyond the tradition and focusing on uh, in adding the, the, the fact that uh, we do need to kind of creatively find uh, defense in tap uh, would be, I think, a, a, a an important step toward uh, achieving what we all collectively need, want to do, and maybe you know better and more resilient communities with respect to natural hazards. Let me stop there. Thank you, Dr. Mosle. Um, super poignant points about um, diversity, redundancy temporality, uh, all through the kind of uh, ideas of resilience, filtered through ideas of resilience and sustainability. Um, and I think of uh, P Professor Koshimura uh, at, at the end of your talk, giving a sort of a cautionary, you used, uh, um, um, tone that, you know, over-reliance on certain prediction models and that the idea that, uh, you know, therefore it is safe, um, giving people a, a false sense of security about one line. Um, these previous three uh, observations remind us that, that multiple lines um, and, and the time in between when those lines perform can be a way, I think, culturally for for people to get used to the idea of, of creative redundancies uh, as as urban form, as edge conditions. Uh, so profound food for thought. Uh, I'd like to pass the, the, the microphone over to uh, 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 Professor Otsuki uh, next. Yes. Uh, thanks, uh, Mohammed Shaif. And also thanks for Professor Koshimura. I really appreciate the endeavor of civil engineers like Professor Koshimura to uh, concentrate to reduce the risk of the disaster. I appreciate uh, always very much. Um, as I'm not a civil engineer, but uh, studying on the topic of housing and the community like the former <laughs> session, uh, so I'm not uh, a specialist on the civil engineer, but uh, I, I would like to uh, comment uh, one point from the viewpoint of human dwelling uh, during the long process of infrastructure construction. Uh, so uh, this the topic of this session is infrastructure recovery, uh, it is quite important for us to live again uh, in the affected area in several years later. Uh, but uh, when the big construction started, uh, the people affected have to live uh, far from the site uh, original their uh, houses uh to somewhere else for a long uh time so uh i would like to show one slide uh can i can i share this i hope you can see yes we can okay thank you and this is a slide quoting from uh one study uh, which is uh, focusing on the process of slum development. Uh, you, th this is the uh, var various types of uh, process of housing delivery. The first one is traditional sequence uh, for a human being. Uh, originally, uh, we, we, we find land and the people come and we start to uh, build houses. And then uh, at, at the last stage, uh, our, uh, our ancestors uh, had 
created many uh, infrastructures. But in the modern modern sequence, the land, the land uh, was found, and uh, in the beginning, infrastructure will be built, and then the housing without people, empty housing, were built, and then at the last, people come. So this this uh, modern uh, process of housing started just. Uh, at least 100 years, years ago. This is very new type of uh, development process. But uh, after the big earthquake, our government selected to the, this, the, the second modern sequence. After the, after the damage, uh, the land was cleaned up uh, with the high tide and we, lo we lost houses and infrastructures. And then uh, the government started to build infrastructure first and then uh, build housing secondary. And at last people come. The time uh, from the beginning of building infrastructure until people living, uh, in the experience of uh, Tohoku, uh, in average five, six, seven years. And even uh, in the Fukushima nuclear uh, disaster, uh, uh, some people are waiting until now, more than 10 years. So uh, if we think about the, uh, if we think about uh, the reconstruction of infrastructure, we, at the same time, we have to uh, re, uh, think about uh, the duration of people uh, who have to wait the process of uh, infrastructure recovery. So uh, I think the order of reconstruction is uh, important. Uh, we might rethink the order of uh, construction of infrastructure, construct the order of construction of housing, or the order, uh, the order of uh, people's dwelling. Or uh, we can, I, I think somehow we can mix the process, we mix the order of this uh, process somehow. Uh, may, uh, for example, uh, we can make a tentative town on the beside the construction site uh, of the big uh, infrastructure uh, and so on. So uh, this this is the point what uh, I would like to uh, share with you uh, from the viewpoint of housing and the community. That's all from me. Thank thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, and, and lastly, I will hand the mic over to Professor Ishida. Thank you. Thank you, Mohammed, and thank you, Professor Otsuki, and uh, also Professor Koshimura. Uh, I'm uh, uh, living next to next door to the civil engineering department, but I'm not an uh, expert of the tsunami science. So I would like to start uh, about the topic uh, of the infrastructure recovery, uh, especially the value difference between the gray infrastructure and the uh, green structure, green infrastructure. Uh, the Professor Koshimura's, uh, uh, one of the pictures shows a cross section of the coastal area of Sendai, a future multi defense uh, land use plan uh, that shows our uh, kind of a hybrid uh, between the gray infrastructure and the green infrastructure. The current situation uh, after 10 years of the uh, March 11th disaster, uh, through the, this decade, uh, tsunami damage community have completed their kind of a physical environment recovery, uh, such as a set settlement uh, relocation to the higher ground and making elevated ground embankment in the lower coastal plain and also building a kind of multi-different diking in the Pacific coastal, more than 400 kilo 
amazing and long sea wall uh, that could guard the future tsunami disaster. In general, uh, build back better policy in the Sendai framework of a disaster uh, risk reduction advocated in uh, 2015 uh, was orderly, uh, well uh, implemented. However, <clears throat> the ironical situation or uh, difficult to <clears throat> understand is uh, national uh, census data shows of last decade shows that despite building a quite, you know, uh, disaster resilient community at the great cost and manpower, uh, still, even today, the outflow uh, of the resident from disaster settlement have kept, uh, you know, including uh, simultaneously with a kind of a increase of the age group passed away uh, cases. And also from the kind of a questionnaire survey, uh, it can be inferred that the drastic change in the living environment uh, that former residents have been accustomed to living for a long time have a sort of kind of a psychological negative impact, especially for the age groups. In the March 11th reconstruction field of the Tofu community, uh, comparing to the gray infrastructure implementation, uh, green infrastructure, uh, kind of nature-based solution, was mostly not adopted into the national uh, land recovery uh, land planning, uh, mostly because of the kind of engineering evaluation of return on the capital investment is difficult to visualize. And also it takes quite some time, some years to be effective environment. Uh, the green infrastructure works quite well. It takes quite time, uh, especially, you know, uh, the case like, you know, hilltop forest or uh, kind of a woods function for the uh, controlling the river mouse uh, flooding that duration is a very difficult green infrastructure distinctive feature has not like a green infrastructure as a pinpoint, you know, benefit oriented direct, you know, a solution is not easy to visualize. So those features uh, makes the green infrastructure implementation difficult to the uh, national uh, land use plan for the disaster recovery. But uh, generally, uh, infrastructure recovery should contribute not only the physical environment uh, of the community, but also the kind of a psychological environment of the local residents. Uh, infrastructure recovery is a, a quite you know quick and respond immediately in an emergency situation after the disasters, but uh, often involves kind of large scale changes, physical environmental changes of nature. So the local community with a long history of the Tohoku province has been formed corresponding to the distinctive natural landscape and therefore losing uh, its uh, features means uh, the equivalent to losing the collective memory of the settlement and uh, kind of an archive of unique tradition. <clears throat> uh, it is indeed true that the green infrastructure takes quite some time to be effective uh, as for the disaster risk reduction uh, function. Uh, however, but uh, as uh, the uh, Muhammad pick up the kind of a creative redundancy uh, keywords, kind of the dynamic narrative feature uh, cultivated by green infrastructure, formulated over a long period of time, uh, may uh, generate restoring restoring force to the locals, recording the you know kind of a past experiences and the good rich memories. So, in Tohoku region, whatever uh, disaster risk uh, reduction measures are accumulated. Uh, we will not stop the constant kind of dialogue with uh, uncertain natural disasters up to now and 
in the future. So I think that the value of green infrastructure, kind of a polyphonic compound function, not only a, a pinpoint direct uh, recovery function, and the kind of narrative restore, restoring force to the local community um, would be important uh, now after 10 years. Uh, that's all, thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Ishida. So these events are wonderful, but you know, also too short. I feel like we're just sort of scratching at the surface of a really big brainstorm. And, and, and I thank uh, Professor Koshimura uh, for, for the one wonderful lecture. And um, what, what, what I leave, want to leave with a very literal question. Do you ever think, do you dream or think in anything other than concrete? When you're thinking of those lines? Is that the question for me? Yes. Yeah, I think it's, it's, a, it's the concrete structure is not only the part of the civil engineering. So I think it's, uh, I have a very ins much inspired from the concept of like a, like a embedded infrastructure that distributed and a diverse different, uh, diverse defense structure, including the, like a green infrastructure that uh, Professor Ishida mentioned. So I'm very inspired and then hopefully we can, I think it's a kind of a fusion of the, of the concept of the structural uh, thinking, uh, structural point of view. So I think it's a part of the, the good things to collaborate, the civil engineers working with the uh, architects. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, uh, everyone. Again, Professor Koshimura and, and e each of the panelists for spending this time. Uh, we are about uh, uh, just a few seconds away from uh, winding down this panel. Uh, and I would like to uh, mention to the audience uh, that we will be moving into uh, a 10 minute break before the third and final uh, panel begins. Uh, thank you very much again. I'm looking forward to seeing you all. Take care. Bye-bye.
Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome back to uh, ARC DL3 Forum uh, Volume 2, Learning from Tohoku. So uh, this is the panel three, uh, Disaster and uh, Memorialization. My name is Takako Izumi uh, from IRIDIS, International Research Institute of Disaster Science and, uh, of Tohoku University in Japan. So uh, today we will have uh, uh, one uh, wonderful speaker and the four panelists. So first of all, I'd like to uh, introduce our speaker today, uh, Dr. Masashige Motoe, Associate Professor of Department of Architecture and Building Science, Graduate School of Engineering, Tohoku University in Japan. And um, he, has a, a, he has a tremendous uh, experience uh, in supporting various community facilitation and design activities in the areas affected by the Great East Japan earthquake and tsunami and has been closely involved in several memorialization initiatives and the museum. So uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Motoe, for joining us today, and uh, over to you. Okay, uh, thank you for your kind introduction, Izumi-san. Uh, good morning, everyone. Can everyone hear me? It's almost noon in Japan. Uh, good morning and good night or good evening, everyone. So uh, thank you for inviting me to be here at the LC Forum today. Uh, I'm pleased to be here to talk about disaster and the memorialization. The story is based on my own experience after the Great East Japan earthquake, which is still ongoing. Uh, it has been 10 years since 2011. Uh, it's so quick. Uh, approx approximately 20,000 people have lost their lives, uh, including disaster-related deaths, and more than 2,500 are still missing and still searching. Nature provides us infinite values in our daily lives. On rare occasion, however, nature brings with it harsh calamities in the form of earthquake tsunamis, typhoons, volcanic eruptions, and other disasters, a pandemic too. While well, the normally gentle disposition uh, towards the bountiful natural surroundings belies such potentials that the whole area has faced with the power of nature repeatedly uh, in the past. Only in the late 19th and the 20th century, around 100 years, uh, the Tohoku region has hit by tsunamis in 1896, 1933, and 1960. Each tsunami caused significant damages. This storm monument built after uh, the 1933 tsunami is inscribed with the word, uh, if there is an earthquake, be, a, be aware, beware of tsunami. It's a very simple message. Despite our ancestors leaving records in effort to pass down their experiences, the majority of us has failed to keep their warning and were caught unprepared. Disaster is a harsh experience. People are too painful to live with always every day, but uh, so we try to forget. Uh, we have the mechanism to forgetting. It works and it is a relief for the uh, victims and the uh, persons. But we completely forget about it if we will repeat the same tragedy in the future. We are uh, not allowed to forget, but we want to forget. Uh, so we leave our memories to the environment. This type of stone monument is for that purpose. To remember the damage of the disaster itself in a more vivid and graphic form, we leave behind the remains of the disaster. That is the main theme of this uh, speech. This sit is a Kyoto Kumaru number 18. It was swept inland from the port of Kesenuma uh, by the tsunami and remained there. It is very impressive to see such a large ship left on the land. Many people come to see it, take a picture and put it into Instagrams. And there are also small souvenir shops around it. 
and uh, uh, it has become a famous place for people to think about the disaster after 2011. The city mayor made a plan to preserve the ship as a legacy of the earthquake and turn the area around it into the park. In the end, however, the ship was dismantled. While many people came to see the ship, those who lost their homes and families because of the lampage of the ship said that it was painful to see the ship and they did not want to see it anymore. Many of the locals sympathized with this opinion and finally the mayor changed his mind. The ship was eventually dismantled by the owner of the ship. It is another case. This three-story building is a disaster management office for of Minami Sandiku town. A tsunami warning was issued. Residents were asked to evacuate immediately, immediately to higher ground. That kind of announcement has made repeatedly from this building. Tsunami is coming. Go up to hill immediately, quick. Uh, many people heard this announcement evacuated and survived. However, the building was swallowed by the tsunami and 43 people died in the building, including the person who was making the announcement until the end. The ruined building became a kind of symbol of a disaster, but after discussion with the local residents, the city mayor, town mayor decided to demolish the building as it could have hindered the reconstruction process. Another reason was that it was difficult for such a small town to maintain it uh, as a legacy for a long time in uh, financial reason. However, later, the governor of Miyagi Prefecture proposed to keep the building as a legacy of the disaster and the building became the property of the prefecture now, the governor people. The surrounding area has been turned into the raised park. And the, and the building standing on its original ground has been uh, left in the bottom of an amphitheater-like landscape like that. The remains of the disaster are a uh, very political space, as you know. Uh, what should be left and what should be lost. The memories are a political issue too. Uh, what is to be remembered and what is to be forgotten. This is Okawa Elementary School. It was located five kilometers away inland from the sea, but because it faced a large river, uh, it was hit by tsunami that came up along the river, unexpected. 74 children and 10 teachers died because uh, they failed to escape from tsunami. There was a mountain just nearby, but uh, they did not evacuate there. The trial to hold the school accountable is still going on now. Oikawa Elementary School became the site of one of the most severe tragedies uh, of the Great East Japan earthquake. It has become a place where many people, including parents, uh, visit to mourn their children. So sad place. Uh, it was decided to preserve Oikawa Elementary School as a legacy of the disaster, and the maintenance work is currently uh, underway. It must be open soon. Many people visit Oikawa, uh, Okawa Elementary School when they face the tragedy. They are at a loss for words. Even if they were affected by the earthquake, they feel that the tragedy that happened here is incomparable and they are unable to say anything. I show you another case.
this is uh, Nakahama Elementary School. It was preserved as a legacy of earthquake and has been open to the public since last September. Uh, I was in charge of design direction of that. The land is flat, surrounded by rice and vegetable field and the pine trees along the coast. It is only about 400 meters away from the sea, very close. Uh, in the background, there was a village uh, where the children were atten attend uh, the school lived, but it was all washed away by the tsunami. Just the school building remained. Uh, to the north, in this picture, uh, there was a cemetery, but it was all destroyed. The, this picture is before oh, the earthquake. Uh, the school building was built in 1989. It was designed with the latest uh, theory of open school and uh, the village people very proud of that. Very beautiful school, they said, but it was thriving. However, it was hit by a 10 meter high tsunami. The light side, the right side of the screen uh, is the ocean. The first and the second floor are destroyed. And you can see the roof uh, is also broken in the left end, uh, seaside. There were 90 students, teachers, and residents in the school at the time, 90. After the earthquake, there was a warning that the tsunami was coming soon. So the principal gave up on going to the remote evacuation site and send everyone to the roof, up to the roof. Uh, the tsunami came very close to the roof, but fortunately, everyone, everyone was saved. Uh, there were no casualties there. No one died here, right? On the first floor, on the first floor, we limited the floor lines and the secure safety only above the heads. The rest of the building was left as it was, uh, with very little extra work done. You can enter the attic store room. Uh, on the rooftop, children spent the night. Uh, the library on the second floor was turned into the exhibition room with a model of the lost town, a detailed model of the building, and the video showing the overview of the disaster, and so on. The music room uh, became a guidance room. A simple way to design the, uh, this type of remains would be as a place to show the actual threat of earthquake and tsunamis and to introduce the events that took place here. Uh, in the case of this uh, Nakama Elementary School, it is a very heroic story of the principal uh, who saved the lives of 90 people by deciding that to evacuate to the rooftop uh, as the tsunami was approaching. It's a very simple story, clear story. But however, uh, as we started to design the remains as uh, to open to the public and listen to the stories of the survivors uh, or, and the uh, local people who built the schools, uh, we, we realized that there was more to it than that. Especially the principal uh, is still wondering if uh, it was really the right decision to escape to the roof. He said always that if the wave had a bit, just a little bit higher, uh, no one would be here. He's still wondering. Rather than just showing the impact of the tsunami, we discussed with the uh, teachers and the residents uh, what kind of meaning each remaining object had and identified the potential meaning of each object uh, on this place one by one. 
what kind of classes were held in this classroom before it was destroyed? How did people live in the town between the school and the sea? What kind of chatter was going on among the children who had taken refuge in the dark attic in that night? This is a pretty story, but even after the school was closed, some people gathered voluntarily and regularly to plant flowers in the flower bed here. I asked, do you want to continue taking care of the flowers by yourselves even after the school is open to the public as a legacy of disaster? They say yes. So we change the position of the fences so that they can come anytime they want. Nakahama Elementary School here is the place where everyone survived the tsunami. The visitors saw the destruction and felt the threat of the tsunami, but still they feel like relieved. They say it's a kind of warm place. According to the guys, many visitors talk about their own disaster experiences after the tour. It's in contrast to Okawa Elementary School. I think uh, some disaster sites leave everyone speechless, while others, like here, make everyone want to talk much about themselves. I believe the boss, uh, unnecessary memory keepers for us. Finally, uh, I would like to share the term collective memory as a keyword to uh, think about disasters and memorialization. Collective memories is not the same as history or tradition. It is not one big socially integrated story. It is a collection of memories. Each one has a small fragment of personal experiences. However, when the small memories are collected and are made into collective memory, they can function as a, a social framework to recall something. This is significant because an individual's act of recall is always conditioned by the social framework. We cannot recall freely by ourselves, so we need this type of collective memory. But it should be a mush, should not be mushed into a big story named history. I think it is important to collect memories that are unique to each individual and not to grind up grains. We need to uh, design the way to collect memories in correct way. That's it. Sorry to take so long time. Please come to uh, Tohoku to see the remains of the disaster and uh, recovering life. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Motoe, uh, for your very, very informative uh, presentation. For us, uh, and myself, is, is quite impressed to see so many uh, remains were built in the last 10 years, and I'm sure there are more come uh, in the near future. So uh, um, I have just one question to Professor Motoe. You mentioned uh, you evolved in the uh, uh, designing of these remains and buildings. So mm -hmm. in that case, uh, uh, what would be the uh, most important element for you um, mm -hmm. to take into consideration for designing and, and planning and building mm -hmm. these remains? Yes. <laughs> I said I design, but I just keep as it is. But it's not easy because it's broken. But we want to enter there, of course, safely. So it's a, a, a conflict between uh, law and to keep as it is. So the, uh, we discuss about it. And the, the building standard is out of this uh, situation. So we made a new uh, local uh, act to keep this building as a, a kind of cultural thing. So, and, uh, 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 <laughs> 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 <laughs
and uh, put it out of the uh, building standard as a cultural thing. So that is a very one uh, invention to keep this building, uh, to see it and to keep as it is. That's one thing. Make sense? Yeah, definitely. Yes, that definitely makes sense. Thank you so much. And that also shows how we see um, to keep these remains uh, uh, is so important to sh to keep our memories and bring this to the future generations, I think. All right. So uh, now I'd like to introduce our panelists today. Uh, we have four panelists. And first, uh, Professor uh, Ryo Dayen. Uh, he's an associate professor of architectural history at the School of Architecture, Tsinghua University in Beijing. And next is uh, Professor Michael Osman. Uh, he is an associate professor of Department of Architecture and Urban Design at UCLA. And uh, two from Chile, I'm sure that it's already a very late night and thank you so much for your, uh, joining us in such a late night. Uh, professor Renato Dalencon, uh, he's a professor, deputy director, School of Architecture, uh, Pontifical Catholic University of Chile. And also uh, Professor uh, Roberto Morris, and he's a professor of School of Architecture, Pontifical Catholic University of Chile. So now I'd like to uh, invite all of, I mean, each of you uh, to share uh, your comments and also uh, insights uh, with us. So uh, firstly, um, Professor Ruo Dayan, would you please share uh, with us your <laughs> comments? Yeah. Uh, uh, and I'm very glad to, have, to be a part of this uh, great event. Um, I learned a lot from this uh, conference online. Uh, but to be honest, um, I am not uh, an expert on uh, designers and memorization. Uh, we try to be find a good uh, topic to be a part of our joint studio. And I choose once uh, one side, I think it is good. It was good, but uh, finally we found that uh, the the village we ch chose for our st joint studio is very near to the center of 2008 earthquake. But it was not so dam uh, not so greatly damaged. So uh, our so our studio work uh, become has become more focused on the heritage uh, uh, protection rather than the anti-disaster. Anti uh, so this, uh, this is a pity for me to, to go further into the study on disasters. So um, we, we, do, we, we do find, uh, find some uh, relics of uh, the 2008 uh, earthquake in the village uh, whose, uh, whose name is Shaji. We I have told in uh, before the uh, conference. Uh, there are two reasons uh, the local people are trying, were try, uh, are trying to preserve them. One is the memory of uh, the earthquake. Uh, it's, it's quite conflict. Uh, it, um, it, it's painful to for the local villager to record uh, the event, but also they don't want to forget it uh, totally. So it's very conflict. And the other reason for uh, them to preserve them to preserve the uh, traditional house that were uh, damaged greatly in the in 2008 earthquake is that. They are traditional houses, and uh, it, it and they are cultural heritage. So, uh, the local government uh, has some financial support to to protect to preserve the cultural heritage. But uh, I don't have a much uh, a deep uh, thinking about uh, how to how to memorize the disaster event by uh, architectural design. Uh, the local governments uh, spend some money to preserve the old buildings, 
make the lock to disappear. But if we want to use it as the as a usable building, for example, a small museum, it will cost much more. So it's a bit, it's still a problem uh, to how to find enough uh, money to 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 do more to do more things to raise it the the old building into a usable building. So we are still considering this problem now. So I think I need I'd better leave more time to the other experts, and uh, so that uh, we can uh, learn more about uh, disasters and memorize memorialization. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Liu, for sharing uh, your view and comments. And yes, definitely there should be so many difficulties uh, to keep these remains, and also uh, those differences will be dif probably uh, challenges will be different uh, country by country. Okay, thank you so much. So I'd like to hear more about those kind of challenges and also the, your experiences. So uh, next, I'd like to invite uh, Professor Osman uh, to share your views and comments. Um, I, I'm just thankful to be here um, and to meet all of you um, and to be part of the conference. And um, uh, it was, uh, I have to say, a very touching talk. Um, uh, touching, but not exactly sentimental. So I was quite, uh, you know, quite impressed with the level of, um, I would say, kind of um, emotional maturity that uh, it takes after 10 years, you know, to, 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 to gain your, your thoughts. And um, the one thing that came to my mind as you were uh, speaking, Professor Moto, I um, was thinking about how more and more so uh, over the coming years, we'll be seeing um, disasters which are um, uh, somehow um, mixtures between human and non-human causes, right? We, we know human caused disasters and we memorialize those wars and so forth like that. Um, uh, and uh, I, I would say the history of the ruin is largely a history of preserving things from uh, war and memorializing human caused disasters. But I'm thinking now about this uh, post, uh, excuse me, my camera is on the fritz, um, post climate change uh, situation where more and more so our memorials for disasters will be a mixture of our own legacy of, um, uh, for lack of a better word, a kind of addiction to the fossil fuel uh, and uh, also uh, natural calamity. So I, I, I'm thinking about what it means to have a kind of um, a new memorial and you, I think, gave good evidence of what that looks like, a memorial that is um, a mixture of knowing that uh, there are multiple causes uh, that are intermixed in the calamity. It's no longer warfare. We no longer know who the enemy is. Uh, it's, it's, uh, we no longer, uh, all we know is we have trauma and that we have loss. So I was very touched by your, um, by, by your um, uh, portrayal of that kind of architecture, uh, how those ruins became memorials. I also was um, uh, fascinated with the reference to Maurice Halbach, um, who is an interesting character uh, because of the way in which he thought through um, uh, ur urban uh, uh, space as having some kind of uh, already the function of memory built within it. And how, um, as you said, uh, um, the, the, our memories, which are virtual, which are not physical, are somehow always um, also made physical in the world so that we can uh, remember through, through the physical world as well as through our emotional world. And I guess to mix those two ideas uh, together, uh, the first one about uh, the mixture of calamities uh, are, that are both human and non-human and the idea of collective memory, um, I'm kind of thinking about what it means to have, uh, say, monuments of emotional resilience. Mm -hmm. um, because if we're thinking about um, urban infrastructure and its resilience in relationship to um, uh, climate change uh, and the disasters that will uh, uh, for sure become a 
a bigger and bigger part of our uh, lives. Um, I suppose uh, what, what kind, uh, I think you brought, brought up a really interesting point because we have now to look back on the past uh, not just with a, a, a hope for a more resilient future, but also a kind of emotional resilience about the, about the present. So now our memorials are ever more and more becoming about how we manage our lives in the present, yes. in the changing calamities that we mm -hmm. have today. So I, I'm very grateful to your talk because it really made me think about how uh, what we thought were uh, long ago ruins of uh, of a, a heritage culture yeah. are slowly catching up to us. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so we have to think about what it means to produce uh, monuments of emotional resilience. That's great. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Professor Zuman. I think you raised a very important and interesting point, uh, including climate change and, uh, and also the emotional uh, uh, the, the resilience of our future as well. So uh, next, I'd like to invite uh, Professor uh, Daloncon from uh, uh, Pontifical Catholic University of Chile. Over to you. Thank you very much. Yes, I would like to also, in the same vein as Michael, I would like to emphasize the uh, impression that it made on me, uh, Professor Motoy's perspective, Summarizing maybe what uh, seems to be the most, um, uh, um, I don't know, strong piece of wisdom that I, that I take with me. He says, uh, because there was this such a loss, because there's this suffering, we mm -hmm. want to forget. And thus we leave our memories to the environment. Mm -hmm. This struck me really as, um, a very, very deep consideration in regard of the disaster experience and the aftermath. But at the same time, what I think is maybe um, a broader sense of this is not leaving our memories in the sense of getting rid of them, as mm -hmm. one could maybe read it at first, but it's also expressing these uh, um, uh, laws, you know, taking it out of ourselves, mm. out on on the on the environment, but also in society. You know, we yeah. share it by by giving it away, and mm. then we we start a kind of transaction with this with the physical world where we live and where mm. we share as as human beings. So I I would I would say this is. Um, the, the core of what I take with me in, in that this is exactly what architecture does at large. You know, mm. It's like articulating our own pieces of culture, history, feeling, etc. On the, on the built environment and there we can somehow heal or elaborate or develop our culture, our suffering, uh, our feelings, uh, our, our identities, etc. So um, I believe, even if you said, I did not design, uh, well, this is, I would argue, seen under this perspective that you propose, this is a pure architecture of the deepest kind. So I, I thank you very, very much. I think it's a very, very clear uh, conceptualization to understand and that brings me at least not only in the perspective of uh, disaster um, and, and post-trauma etc but as I say uh, in architecture at large to a deeper understanding. Thank you very much Professor Thank Motor. You. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Darinkun, for sharing your view and from the architects and how difficult and important uh, to take into consideration that kind of elements into the real uh, architect. Okay, uh, so the next, I'd like to invite uh, Professor Morris uh, from Pontifical Catholic University of Chile. Uh, over to you, Professor Morris. Thank you. Um, yes, it's a very interesting uh, 
experiences uh, we can see with Professor Motoy um, in, in, in Chile has uh, several similarities with uh, Japan, um, but respect to this um, case of memorization, I think we had been evolving in the in the in the, in the last um, years because uh, we are very proud to be um, to have this uh, seismic culture, um, but especially in the world of um, structural engineers, they have been for decades very interested in into be learning from our experiences, um, taking information of every disaster to learn. But the common population, we have been trained to forget, you know, we are, we, we have this earthquake and we need to clean and to be prepared for the, for the new one. Um, but that, that is why we, we didn't have this um, practice to maintain some um, buildings of some rings as a, as part of our um, knowledge or a part of our uh, learning, uh, but I have to say that this is changing um, because uh, one example of uh, this idea of forget I think is also related with our experience with the military regime is a. Uh, is uh, our cities, the whole country is full of places where they are, they are very strong for our um, nation, nation, but in some way we didn't know <laughs> that they are there in the cities. Uh, I had the opportunity a few years ago to work with my student in, in to be recognizing these places places where we are walking every day and we we know something about that place but in some way we need it we need it that we needed to forget um even our uh, uh, um, national stadium the most important in chile was used um to torture uh, chilean citizens that it was very very strong um but at the same time, I think I have to say that in the last decades, we had been taking notice that we need to go back to these places and to rebuild these stories. And that is something that I want to connect with uh, uh, Professor Mutua with. Uh, he said that the memories are political issues. I think that is something that is taking um, more and more importance uh, because we need to go back and recognize these stories. I, I, I really like the, the case of uh, the Nakahara um, school because it's, it's, a, it's a good story. It's, you know, it's a successful story that uh, um, in this case, we can see the building, but in other cases, maybe maybe we can not recognize the building. And I think that is something we can deal in the future, um, taking um, uh, some architectural elements or sometimes just some memories. I think it, um, now we are more aware. I, th I have to say that especially because our interaction with the Japanese uh, um, professionals, academics, I think we had been talking a lot about memories um, and how we can take advantage of experiences. Um, I, it's, it's like uh, Renato said, I like uh, when, <laughs> The the, the 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 new perspective of, of uh, design, you know, we do, we can we can design with words, we can design with sounds, uh, different kind of experiences. I think it also is a is a is a way to design this the space, you know, um, and also this is a is a collective con uh, um, uh, construction. In two thousand and ten, we had this earth, big earthquake and tsunami but for for the chilean society tsunami was something new and that was a very strong expression of the distance between our collective memory 
the, 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 the institutional memory um, with the ge geological memory because the, the country, um, Chile as a territory, mm. knew about these uh, tsunamis. We had a lot, a, a lot of experiences of tsunamis. But for us, for our generation, was funny. It's also it's, it's funny and sad, but it's a, it was something new. <laughs> Uh, and, 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 and that is, I think it's a very strong, um, experience that we had that we need to be very aware about these uh, memories and how we can use these memories as a political issues to, to educate the society in a different way, but also to build a more resilient uh, society. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Mutoy. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Morris, for sharing your experiences in Chile. I totally understand Japan and Chile has a similar uh, kind of experiences in terms of uh, earthquake and tsunami as well. So thank you for sharing that. Okay, so uh, now we have a couple of questions to uh, Professor Motoe from the audience. Mm -hmm. So uh, first question um, from a student from University of Washington, uh, Lan. Uh, Ms. Lan Nguyen, mm. uh, memories as a political statement is an interesting concept. Mm. So other than financing and trauma associated with seeing uh, monuments, mm. what are other considerations for uh, preserving sites? Mm. Uh, thank you for the question, Ms. Uh, there, there must be a, a lot of consideration about that, around that. So, ne. Hi. <laughs> and uh, so one thing is uh, related with uh, Michael mentioned that the uh, man-made disaster and natural hazard. The situation is so complicated. It, it is not divided into two. It, uh, even in uh, uh, our 2011's disaster. Uh, so that's a big issue. No one mentioned about the uh, accident of the nuclear power plant in today. So it is too difficult to mention easily. In that case, it's too political. That is a complicated nature and man-made uh, disasters. And uh, not just accident there, but the uh, uh, following policies to evacuate the people around there to uh, hundreds of uh, not ten thousand people move to force move to the other area. That's a very political issue. Uh, it is too difficult to mention still, uh, even after ten years. And, uh, that is why I'm saying. Uh, it's ongoing. Uh, the national government and uh, uh, electric power company built a new memorial facility just nearby the uh, nuclear plant site. Uh, but it, the presentation of that in that facility is, many people say it's very limited. Very few reflection why the accident happened. They're just talking about the fact what happened. Tsunami came and uh, they lost in the blackout and uh, some uh, radioactivity spilled out. But they don't mention about why that kind of things happen. It's still uh, difficult to uh, talk about that. Uh, I think it must be take more time to make clear what's happened there and uh, what should do uh, for the future. So the uh, nuclear plant case is very special thing, but even if in the uh, school case or other more smaller uh, case, there must be a, a kind of complicated situation occurred. Uh, especially the, when the person died there, there must be a reason. 
uh, based for himself or herself or some political reason, what kind of powers uh, influenced to the behavior of that guy. So that is a very complicated thing. So, hi. <laughs> so we need to uh, discuss deeply, not just an uh, integrated simple story of history, but uh, we need to collect uh, the precise memory every time, everywhere. <laughs> Does that make sense? Is it the answer to the uh, question to Daran, right? Sorry. That's um, it. Okay. So, uh, I have another question. It's quite yes. similar and actually related to what you answered right now, uh, coincident. Yeah. So another question is from uh, uh, Mr. Tatsuo Sakamoto, Associate Professor uh, yes. of NUS in Singapore. So uh, he says, uh, it reminded me of a discussion on Hiroshima and also the game back to Shiryokan. Mm -hmm. So uh, do you see any similarity between two cases, and, and, and I'm sure it's particularly in the, the ruins and the remains and the Hiroshima Dome? Mm. Good question. <laughs> of course, that uh, uh, the Hiroshima Dome is um, king, a kind of king of kings of memorial facilities. So there are a lot of topics uh, uh, related with the Hiroshima domes. When I, while we design discussing about the Nakahama Elementary School, we sometimes refer to the Hiroshima dome. For example, one one important thing is uh, uh, planning time. How long should we keep that monument as it is? In the Hiroshima case. Uh, they have well organized to maintain that building a very long time. Uh, they collect a bunch of donations and uh, are organizing to keep and maintain it. It's very important, uh, very big effort. But in Nakama case, it's similar to the Minami Sandik three stories building case. The finances, serious matters. They cannot decide uh, to keep that school forever. It's impossible. They just planned uh, to keep that uh, memorial facility just 20 years because uh, that is a limitation of the concrete body of the school. Just 20 years. They have not decided uh, uh, more plan to how to keep it or close it or dismantle it, they do not decide yet. That is uh, difficult things to different point to keep forever. What do you mean forever? But the uh, Hiroshima case and the uh, very limited Nakama case is different from that's I found now uh, the difference between Hiroshima and my, our case, right? Thank you, Professor Motoe, for answering the question. Yeah, definitely, that's a very, very important, uh, crucial point. And, yeah, to think about after 20 years, how are we going to do with these uh, remains we, we established uh, everywhere? Mm. Mm. Okay, so um, also, uh, Professor uh, Osman, you also mentioned about the museums uh, for man-made, uh, you know, the sort of the disasters and, and conflicts as well. Do you have any uh, in, in observation on in, an opinion on this question? Yeah, uh, I, I wanted to respond to the idea of heritage. Um, uh, it seems a little bit uh, complicated to talk about this as heritage. Mm. Um, it definitely represents memory. But, you know, when we talk about heritage, usually we talk about something like having art value. Mm, you yeah. know? And in this case, it's really, uh, if anything, the memory is just painful mm. without any kind of cultural value. Mm. So I, I'm, uh, I wanted to kind of distinguish those two kinds of things from one another, the kind of 
monuments of heritage and cultural memory and some kind of something that may even belong as a kind of positive view of the past and something like uh, and that is maybe also shared among like mankind or something and this which is just trauma and it's actually quite local yes right as much as we as much as i feel the the pain as you tell us <laughs> professor motoy about the experience i wasn't there you know um and so for me it's it's uh, it's only a clue um and it's not it's not uh it's not like culture where in the way i can appreciate it it unravels a story it really requires witness so mm -hmm. your um your story was so powerful because of the act of witnessing and mm -hmm. i i actually wanted to ask you about how you can embed into the memorial yes. the act of witnessing mm -hmm. Do you have any answer, uh, Professor Motoy, on that question? That's yeah, big question. How to embed it? Yeah. Mm. One thing, the the facility, the uh, hardware of that building itself has very limited ability to keep that kind of stories. The, uh, the Nakahama school has a lot of guides to uh, tell a story, what's happened here, uh, to the visitors. That is a crucial activity to keep the meaning of that areas. That is also, so, uh, fortunately, our design team, uh, including not just a building, but, uh, uh uh, some exhibition materials, some in guidance videos, and some uh, guidebooks, and so on. So that's a, a consistent uh, whole, totally designed. And also, uh, we discussed the guide, how to uh, explain what's happened. So, uh, and of course, the guide has uh, their own individual experiences, so they can speak. Uh, individually to the visitors, but that whole uh, activities are set of to embed embed something to the memorial site. I think so. That is very fragile to keep it. So the uh, the most of the guys are elder person. They have a very strong motivation to uh, memorialize. Uh, for the future, but the younger people has very limited experiences. It's difficult to keep motivation to guide there. So that's a problem, I think. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Motoe, for answering the question and also sharing your comments, uh, Professor Osman. So uh, unfortunately, we have very, very limited and also little time uh, until the end of this session. So I'd like to ask each of the panelists at the end, um, mm. since this is the last uh, session, what will be your expectation of this ArcDR3 uh, in the future? We will have continue another year, but uh, what would be the, your uh, sort of the, also the contribution you can, you can, you, you hope and also the expectation. Uh, so from uh, Mr. The Professor Ryo, Mm -hmm. Professor Ruo, can you hear me? Here, yeah, uh, sorry. Um, uh, I, I would like to learn more from our colleagues uh, from the whole Asia Pacific uh, universities. Um, uh, maybe uh, uh, we can share some idea about our joint studios, our students. Okay, that's all. Thank you. No, you, you are muted. Oh, sorry. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, we are really, really looking forward to working with you uh, in the near future. Yes. So, as next, uh, Professor Osman. Yep. And I'm, I'm just, I, I 
actually this very panel and this very topic is very meaningful to me. Um, and actually even the idea of how we uh, archive and um, memorialize our discussion here, yes. right? So one really important topic to consider is how we, I mean, as Mohammed puts this together into a, a volume, I'm, I'm very keen to see how that uh, really changes the way we, we think and, and talk about these kinds of um, topics. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, definitely, this is a very important point, and we hope to uh, continue the discussion in the future on this topic. So, uh, Professor uh, Darenton? Yes, I think um, it's uh, clear that we learn in these sessions, and we somehow shape the problems that we are addressing uh, clearly. The question is, of course, how to move on from that to action in a topic that uh, where action is somehow intertwined. So it happens very suddenly that a disaster hits and we just need to be ready. So developing readiness is what I would expect from this sessions for, uh, to, for us to develop and build on. Okay, thank you very much for your uh, word. So our next, uh, Professor Maurice. Yes, I think it's, um, this uh, network has been a very good opportunity to, to, to work with Renato. I think we have been enjoying to work together, but at the same time, we had the opportunity to be participating in this international workshop the last time we were talking about multi or now about memory, you know, it's something um, different, but at the same time, we can do that connect those connections. I think our challenge as a, as part of this network of this network is how we can involve our students and I, how they can take advantage of this network. I think that is our task. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much. And once again, thank you for all the uh, uh, panelists and also the speaker for joining us today. And I'm so sorry we have to close now. And although uh, we have so many things we'd like to discuss and continue uh, the discussion. So now I'd like to close uh, the session. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much to all of our presenters and our panelists and our moderators for panels one, two, and three. It's really great discussion. And I also want to um, say a special thank you to uh, Natsuki Iwami and with the support of Professor Yasuki Onada, who helped put together our great video of the Sendai Design League um, for all of us today. So um, the Sendai Media Tech is our beloved architectural landmark in Sendai, and we hope to see you there in person, but I'm glad we could at least see it um, vi virtually, thanks to their great work. So thank you again for that so much. And as we near the conclusion of our forum for today, it's my great honor to invite Tohoku University Executive Vice President for General Affairs, Financial Affairs, and International Relations, Toshia Ueki, to give us some closing remarks. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, on behalf of Tohoku University, I'd like to say a few words uh, to conclude this wonderful RTR3 forum. Uh, we, Tohoku University, are very much honored and privileged to co organize uh, this second RTR forum uh, today. And uh, first of all, I, I'd like to thank all the speakers, panelists, commentators as well as organizers and uh, coordinators, which made this wonderful uh, forum possible. And uh, I already mentioned 10 years have passed since the great East Japan earthquake. So 10 years seems to me and seems to uh, many people in Tohoku, on the one hand, very long, on the other hand, very short. So we need a lot of things to discuss uh, our uh, colleagues all over the world, especially as a Pacific Rim partners. And today's forum seems to me a very wonderful and very fruitful one. And uh, I strongly believe that the uh, 
UCLA and uh, Tohoku and Miraikan collaboration through this uh, APRU network, uh, especially in the Pacific Green Partners, seems to me very useful and fruitful. And I strongly believe that uh, we need uh, much more collaborations. And uh, especially in this uh, COVID-19 pandemic, uh, made us a uh, new phase of resilient society in broader sense. So we need a lot of academic collaboration as well as a factual collaborations in near future. So we are very much looking forward for the collaborations uh, to these participants, as well as uh, many new partners, uh, Pacific uh, area especially. And I'm uh, look, looking forward to further collaboration, strong uh, uh, partnerships. So thank you very much indeed for joining us today. And uh, thank you very much indeed. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Vice President Wiki, for your continued support of ArcDR3 and for your encouraging words today. I know we all are motivated to keep going and thank you for recognizing um, this network. And finally, as we are really nearing the end of today's event, um, I'm pleased to turn over the floor to someone who needs no introduction to us, but um, let me introduce him anyway. Professor Hitoshi Abe, who is a professor of architecture and urban design at UCLA and the director of XLab. Please go ahead. Three, four, I'm learning from Tohoku. I was in Los Angeles 10 years ago, away from Sendai where I grew up, and watching my familiar places being destroyed by tsunami on TV. I can't not believe that it's been 10 years past since, and I feel that the true recovery of Tohoku is still on the way. During these 10 years, it seems that the risk of disasters around the world has been increased, and there have been many tragedies that so many people are still suffering, including this global pandemic. I believe that the accumulation of the knowledge of architecture and urban design for disaster risk reduction and resiliency is needed more than any time ever, and ArcDL3 is one of such efforts. Let me introduce you about the ArcDL3 upcoming program in this year. We'll have three fold events. First one is online exchange meeting with the students participating in ArcDL3 programs titled Post-COVID-19 Era Education. And it is scheduled for late June. Second one is an exhibition about ArcDL3 initiatives scheduled uh, for November, uh, from November 10th to November 30th at the Muromachi Mitsui Hall, Nihonbashi, Japan. This exhibition focused on the works by participating universities and the discussions around the regenerative urbanism. Will be, this will be the great opportunity to share the knowledge we gain through ArcDL3 initiatives with the general audiences in Japan. As a part of this exhibition, the third ArcDL3 forum, Manifestations of Regenerative Urbanism at the Nihonbashi will be held on November 13th and 14th. Uh, this event will be possible for general support of uh, actually Mitsui Fudo-san, and I really hope that we can finally get together physically to share our knowledge and experiences. At the last, I'd like to give big applause to all of the participants for the successful event and also express my great appreciation to Tohoku University for being great host, especially coordination team, including of course you Liz, who worked so hard to make this event successful. So thank you very much. And of course, also thank you very much to all of you on the other side of the screen for watching ArcDR3 forum until the end. So please stay tuned with ArcDL3 and our programs in the future. Thank you. The end.